listening to Awake Radio. Straight talk for the awake and aware. Hello, you're listening to Chrissy McMahon, and this is Alchemical Connections. Thursday mornings, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, only on awakeradio.co.uk. Straight talk for the awake and the aware. Join us. You're listening to Shaziz Radio with the widest variety of original music types anywhere in the world, 24-7, all, all day, day, all, all night. night. Good evening. Welcome to Alchemical Connections, and I'm your host, Chrissy McMahon. Today is Sunday, January 26th, 2014, and it's cold, minus 7 degrees Celsius, snowing. And a good night to snuggle up for a very interesting story about a very taboo topic. Most states ignore it. There are a few cases brought to trial outside the sensationalized Vatican pedophile cases, which are more of a distraction than a solution to a global problem. Tonight's topic is sex trafficking, brought to my attention recently because of a friend's heartfelt concern for students at the Canton, Pennsylvania High School, girls being drugged by their male classmates and sold for sex. The aftermath, the cover-up. Human trafficking is epidemic. My good friend Carolyn Rose Goida lost her home after exposing a sex ring of school children using the school pictures as menus in Missouri and recently the National Human Trafficking Resource Center reported 9,000 cases of potential human trafficking between 2007 and 2012 women and men alike domestic farm and sex workers the majority were Mexican Filipino and Chinese the best defense against sex trafficking is to teach girls and boys their true value in the eyes of God. And that was Debbie Colton, the founder of the independent faith-based victim services program called Oasis of Hope in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And that brings me to my wonderful guest, Douglas Dwayne Dietrich. How may we help you? Good evening, Mr. Douglas Dietrich. How are you? Fine. Much the better for speaking with you, dear lady. I take it that we are on air. Yes, we are live. And uh, thank you for coming to Alchemical Connections here on Awake Radio and Shaziz Radio, which we will be uh, momentarily. I have to check and see if we're on order DJ over there. But um, our topic tonight is uh, sex trafficking. And if you could please uh, repeat your introductory statement because nobody could hear it. Because of Understood. the horrible distortion. Bandwidth issues. Yes, we seem to be having quite a bit of bandwidth issues these days everywhere with the Skype, which of course is an acronym for Skype, peer-to-peer. And uh, a lot of people use the same bandwidth within um, a person's neighborhood if they live in a high-traffic area. So the I live, of course, in the city of San Francisco, or more appropriately, I'm stranded here. Uh, nobody really lives in San Francisco except for the elite and the filthy rich. The rest of us are kind of too poor to afford to, to be able to afford to move. <laughs> so <laughs> in terms of that, I'm in a neighborhood where many people are getting on Skype simultaneously at, in the evening, and so sometimes the bandwidth gets chewed up very rapidly. So um, fortunately... I'm one of the few people left in the United States who has a landline, as uh, many people don't even have those anymore. And uh, that's part of our uh, very radically changing uh, social situation. And it's not changing for the better because it makes it very difficult for talk radio, whether it's digital or terrestrial, because cell phone quality is, of course, terrible. Now, speaking of terrible audio quality, 
my voice uh, is still very raw. And um, the lovely uh, lady, Chrissy McMahon, who has been gracious enough to act as hostess to myself this evening, will, of course, be uh, assuming the role of adult supervision and taking Mm -hmm. over whenever I begin to hack my lungs out, at which point I will go mute. And uh, she will, of course, emphasize her own knowledge, uh, which is uh, growing by the day, concerning uh, this issue. As a matter of fact, uh, as she herself has said, there's no such thing as coincidence. It was basically about half a week, uh, the first Tuesday of this month and the first Tuesday of this year, that she was working with a friend of hers who was uh, a bit of an artist, and uh, she was helping them uh, basically rearrange the home or something of that nature when she found out about basically her own uh, regional area's version of the McMartin preschool scandal. Now, this was a high school, but what makes it so shocking was that there was an organized trafficking ring that had the cooperation of the boys in the school who were basically uh, date-rape drugging uh, the girls who were their classmates and uh, selling them, basically, for sex. And before I go into my perspective on uh, the social context of all of this. I would appreciate it, dear lady, uh, if you have not done so already. Could you give us some more details that you found out about that? Because I am very curious. Um, I'm not sure what you're talking about, but my situation was um, I was helping a good friend of ours. Uh, she has a studio, and I do uh, ceramics or pottery there and uh, I was helping her clean and, and uh, we were doing cobwebs <laughs> and I don't even know how we got in the conversation but we uh, she's, she works with women and children and that's her passion and she doesn't really like to talk about any of these other issues that are going on in the world which are my passion so she kind of shut me up about that so um, I started to ask her questions about the work that she does and we got into this conversation about sex trafficking at the local high school uh, Canton, Pennsylvania is not 30 miles from, uh, if it's 15 miles maybe from here. And uh, it's quite amazing that when she was telling me the story that the, the boys in the school are being trained to drug the girls in the, in the high school and and get them involved in sex trafficking. And then the, the, the big push there is for the community to try to help these women and the boys as well. And the biggest problem with the women that uh, my friend Gail Jones, uh, she's the artisan, had told me was uh, that the girls, when the, once they stop doing this, they're so used to being with a man that that's all that they know and that's all that they go back to. So it actually entrains them for, uh, for just horrible uh, lifestyle. And I guess part of the reason uh, how they might get involved is they might come from poor families. But I haven't been able to talk to this lovely woman. Her name is Debbie Colton. She's the founder of Oasis of Hope. It's an independent faith-based uh, victim services in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And I have sent an email a couple weeks ago. And um, other things had have, have come across my my desk here. So I've been involved in quite a lot of things and uh, and I hadn't had a chance to to uh, resend the emails and, and try to get her on live because that's what she does she talks about this and I know she'll she'll be very interested but I I hadn't made a formal request it was kind of through my friends and uh, they, they passed around the email so uh, I need to send her a formal but my shock was realizing that it's only 30 miles from where my 12 year old niece is or going to school, and we're right. in the in the mountains. We're we're in a real rural, secluded area. I mean, you need a car to go anywhere here. It's just it's it's just really secluded. And and to think, you know, I always had this idea that well, I understood about my girlfriend Carolyn Rose Goida, who who lost her home, actually lost her home, because she exposed a sex ring of children where they were using the school class pictures as menus. Now, this has been going on for a long time. This isn't something new, but I guess it's so devastating. And then uh, today I was reminded of the, the, the Franklin conspiracy, 
were a boys town and, and, and different aspects of people even as high as the presidential uh, people who were involved in the elections and all that uh, were implicated and nothing ever came of that. It was a big cover up. So what happens is it, it's so devastating that I really blacked it out of my mind. I couldn't even watch that video. It's just so devastating. And uh, I've been trying I since understand. 2009 to even watch it in full. So it's it's quite right. uh, horrible. This is just horrible. And then we're talking about little children. But this isn't just isolated with women or girls. This is happening mm -hmm. to men, too. And it's happening all around the world. And uh, it's, it's just devastating. And it, and it just needs to be uh, shared, you know, just at the same level of, of chemtrails. And 9-11 uh, was a inside job and all these other things that were, you know, even to where uh, aliens are really walking among us. <laughs> well, there's also these horrible things that are happening that uh, people are doing to each other. Uh, not just right. wars over in Afghanistan and Iraq and wherever else, but right here in our in our neighborhoods. Uh, these well, horrible things we're doing to each other. So, uh, go ahead, Douglas. Right. No, thank you very much for uh, contextualizing that. And my mistake, and I understand why it was uh, why there was a miscommunication on my part. Uh, in my area of the world, which is urban, most of the time such operations involve basically drugging the girls uh, initially. Right. So there's officially a date rape drug involved. So I had assumed that that was what was going on here. But apparently that was not the case. What was going on was basically these traffickers were young boys who had obviously been recruited by an organization to yes. basically recruit young girls who, in a sense, thought it was a conscious decision on their own parts mm. to uh, sell their bodies for extra money. They possibly were uh, basically, uh, shall we say, convinced that this was self-empowering oh. because they would making, be making a lot of money on the side and also they were probably told, and this is what many pimps do, they were told that uh, they were being um, somehow suppressed or repressed by their own parents. Yeah. So a lot of these young ladies kind of have this need to assert their independence, and they choose to do so in, uh, with the only equipment that they have, which is their body at that time in their lives, because they obviously do not have their own property. Uh, they're not of legal age to own property, and therefore they uh, take to the streets, so to speak, and get involved with this kind of activity. So the greatest um, ally that the me that the pimps and the sex traffickers have in this regard is the American media, because it's the American media that tends to really promote the need for quote unquote independence and asserting yourself, and uh, it gives people the impression that if they are somehow not promiscuous, they're somehow missing out. So we get that through the music industry, we get that through the media industry, and the end result is a lot of children feel that they're somehow being uh, locked up, that they're somehow being isolated, and um, the young ladies are very vulnerable in this regard because in reality, the ability to make mature decisions for anybody, whether a male or a female, I honestly don't believe really kicks in until they're in their mid-20s, maybe about a quarter of a century old. So I honestly think that people are quite vulnerable up until the age of 21. But, of course, as you mentioned, your daughter is 12 years old. The my nieces, age, my nieces. My daughters are nieces, grown. Right. These are my nieces. My apologies. <laughs> That's okay. I have grandchildren. I have a granddaughter who's five, you know. Yeah, I, it's, this is real. I, yeah, I, would, I would never have guessed that you are a grandmother. <laughs> By my voice? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Douglas, you know, we're going to spend the whole evening complimenting each other. <laughs> You're well, so wonderful. You, you at least, you at least <laughs> Save your it. voice. And, um, <laughs> the, the, I, I, I would like the uh, listenership to understand that, as compared to myself, um, Chrissy McMahon is uh, basically working for a living. She's uh, been a parent. Um, she has had all of these responsibilities and still finds the time and energy to be uh, socially active. 
Now, someone like myself, believe me, it's a lot easier in so many ways because I'm just this side on the borderline of being pretty much just a homeless veteran. Um, all of my family is dead. My parents are dead. My siblings are dead, at least all of those that I knew and cared about. So in terms of my life, there's no one else that I'm placing at risk, and uh, I'm pretty much free to do whatever it is I want. So as a lone wolf and a lone agent, uh, I have far less. Uh, to worry about, and uh, I'm not concerned with uh, living up to the standards of whatever employment might be needed to uh, basically help my family. I, I'm, I'm relieved of a lot of responsibilities, so it always astonishes me when I see uh, good-hearted people like um, Mata McMahon, who has raised a family, is working, and is still finding time to expose things like this. It, it honestly is beyond my comprehension. Well, so it's not we, anything that I plan to do. It's part of my nature. I've always been socially active and always looking for, uh, curious and looking for the truth. And uh, I still haven't found it all, but I, I found someone in you who has uh, really given a wealth of information to the public. And and tonight, um, you're just blowing my mind with your... Um, experience and understanding of this topic it's just uh, amazing I'm, I'm very honored and thank you for well, being here well i very much appreciate that and i do want to make a distinction uh you, you what uh, first off let me correct that mistake i made about your niece your niece is about 12 years old the average age of entry into prostitution for a child victim in the united states is 13 to 14 years of age that's per the united states department mm. of justice now it's important to remember how do they get young boys involved in recruiting young girls uh, rural high schools, like uh, what was taking place less than 30 miles from where you live, well, as you say, more like 15 miles from where you live. Well, human trafficking generates, as far as we know, $9.5 billion a year in the United States. By the way, that's not a United States statistic. That is a statistic that was gleaned by the United Nations. So the United Nations had to conduct an independent investigation into the U.S. industry of sex trafficking because there is no national investigation within our constitutional republic itself of this phenomena. We live in a very um, disjointed and fragmented and atomized society. And when you're contending with responsibilities like this, theoretically it would fall under the venue of the FBI or the Federal Bureau of Investigations. The reality is that uh, the FBI does very little concerning human trafficking. They leave most of the responsibility to local constabularies right. who simply are not equipped to handle the national uh, um, phenomena. <coughs> now, forgive me. As I said, my voice is going to be breaking at times, at which times I'll let um, uh, our... Yes. Um, uh, the young lady who is our resident grandmother here, Mate <laughs> 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 McMahon, take over. I'm Bachi, but right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but right now, uh, but right now, I, I seem to be doing okay. Um, to emphasize this again, we have approximately 300,000 children at risk of being prostituted in the United States. Now, this is a U.S. Department of Justice statistic, so that at least shows you that they're admitting to the tip of the iceberg of the problem. Now, if they say something like that, then you know it's a lot higher. It's got to be around half a million. And uh, the um, pimps who control these children, they make around 150000 to $200,000 per child each year. And the average pimp has four to six girls. Now, that's per not the U.S. Department of Justice. That's not for the FBI. That statistics comes to us from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. <laughs> so that shows you that we need independent charities, essentially, uh, to help us monitor this phenomena. So the average victim is uh, sometimes forced to have sex up to 20 to 48 times a day. We may as well say half a hundred times a day. Uh, so between a quarter of a hundred to half a hundred times a day is when some of these, uh, is, is the amount of uh, coitus uh, engagements that these children are uh, forced to perform. Uh, this is, of course, just heinous. And uh, there are fewer. Now, think of the statistics I've just given you of about half uh, a million children that are probably living like this. The amount of money that is generated by them for the scum of the earth 
and the average um, a person who is doing this is a runaway, uh, mostly just trying to defy their parents. Uh, as I said, try to use the only uh, method of self-expression that they have in this defiance, which is their body, because they are too young to be of age to own legal property, whether a firearm or real estate or even an automobile. They're not of legal age to drive. So these people wind up in the hands of uh, people they think might understand them, uh, who claim that they love them. And these are, of course, uh, predatory males, uh, overwhelmingly. Now, to take care of all of these victims who escape or try to escape from this lifestyle, we have fewer than 100 beds available in the United States for underage victims. Now, think yes. of the statistic of that. That's, it's, it's just insane. Now, that's per the Department of Health and Human Services. That's a national department of the federal government that is giving us that statistic. So that's the insanity of the society in which we live. Uh, you have a federal government which is able to churn out a statistic like that, which is appalling and is unable, uh, along with its uh, law enforcement agencies, to do anything about it. So you have to ask yourself, how is this possible? Well, I could go to town blaming the government and certainly will call them on areas where they are responsible or even directly involved in child trafficking. Unfortunately, what makes this such a bizarre situation in American culture, which, of course, I've served overseas in the Gulf War, as Ms. McMahon knows, and uh, most people who are familiar with me or just look me up will find out all they need to know about me, probably more than they ever want to know. <laughs> and uh, so my biography and my biographical materials are certainly out there. Now, for the asking, for anybody who looks them up, so I was in Southwest Asia, as many people know. I dealt quite heavily with Arabic culture. And Arabic culture and American culture are very similar in many ways that people would never dream of. One of them is this dichotomy between the sexual exploitation of boys and the sexual exploitation of girls. Now, in the Arabic culture, uh, since women are looked on as basically subhuman and they're looked on as basically baby-making machines, uh, most men don't even think about emotionally bonding with them. So they're much more excited to uh, engage in coitus with young boys. So there's an enormous sexual exploitation of young boys in the Arab world. Now, at the same time, they maintain harems and they maintain stables of wives, and they exploit them in the sense where they just basically have them as sex slaves and they keep them constantly impregnated. Now, theirs is the only culture in the world where they use the fertility pill to have them turn out multiple babies at a time. A lot of people are entirely unaware of this, but in the developed areas of the Arabic world, your average birth is going to be multiples because the fertility pill causes the egg to split into quadruplets, quintuplets, uh, sextuplets, uh, so the average mom in Southwest Asia is an octo mom. And so they're treated like animals, they're bred like animals, but none of the men really develop any personal uh, empathy, bonding, or relationship with them. So they do their sexual exploits for thrills with young boys. In America, you have a situation that is grotesquely similar. You've got the overworld as opposed to the underworld, and the overworld the godfathers thereof, deal with uh, schools that are orphanages, like Boys Town, uh, like the McMartin, McMartin Preschool. And uh, it is in those areas that you have young boys, and uh, they have their photos placed in these books that are used as menus for the overwhelmingly male elite. And the overwhelmingly male elite chooses, picks and chooses who they want to have sex with. Now, that is what Carolyn uh, Rose Goida was exploiting, and it was because she exploited that that she lost her home, her right. claim to her real property, <laughs> and basically her life was destroyed. Absolutely. And uh, just an aside, to give you a little chance to take a breather, Carolyn is actually listening, and uh, she and I are, are proverbially fighting over you. <laughs> 
<laughs> because we both love you and we both think you're wonderful and, and she's so grateful that we're bringing up this horror that's happened to her in her own life it's just been four years plus that she's been out of her home um there uh there was damage done to her home they stole everything out of her home um she uh she couldn't even live in the state harley um with her animals they kept harassing her even with her animals it's just, it's just been a horror for her whole life for the last four years and uh, she'd love to start a sanctuary where she's talked to many other people about doing this where we can all get together with creative minds and 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 work on these solutions and doing something uh positive but i just wanted to uh to just let everybody know that carolyn is listening and carolyn is so grateful that we're bringing up uh what has happened to her in her own life uh, as uh, trying to be a champion for truth champion for the children in missouri misery she calls it and uh and just to think that i'm a friend with such a powerful wonderful woman as herself who has done so much good and continues despite she's living in a trailer with her animals and she doesn't have any money most of the time to even get their vet bills paid or food so uh, we do ask for donations for her and you can just send donations directly to the uh, veterinary office or to the local store so she can get uh, kitty litter and cat food and stuff so I just wanted well, to bring I, that up and give you a little break there <laughs> no no it's very much appreciated and I want to put in my own plug for Carolyn Rose Goida I want people to know that She's very similar to a female uh, version of myself in the sense that she also has no family. And uh, she basically is a lone wolf. And uh, uh, the only family she really has at this point are uh, the felines that she's taking care of that I know. I know. I know. (laughs) know. And uh, I knew uh, that uh, for the longest period of time. She um, she's living in a trailer now, which in a sense might be a step up because I know for the longest period of time she was basically living in a hotel room and going from hotel to hotel. But like myself, she's just basically who's someone who's one step away from homelessness and doesn't have uh, this family to anchor her, wherein she is at least liberated to expose and speak of the truth. Now that in no way, shape, or form means that that's an easy task in terms of supporting herself. And so obviously she needs all the help from us that she can get, both in terms of moral support and uh, in terms of, as uh, um, uh, Chrissy McMahon has emphasized, uh, some donations so that she can maintain her uh, tribe of cats. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, and she it's, she's not asking for herself. She's asking for these animals that they'll be destroyed by the uh, the, the system that right. doesn't want to care for these animals either, just like like the people i mean they treat the animals they treat us they're you know we're we're collateral damage we're you know we're just objects we're not people we have no value no intrinsic value in this system and that's globally that's right right. and many people flatter themselves uh, actually flatter themselves by thinking that they are pawns okay the overwhelming majority of U.S. citizens and have explained the meaninglessness of U.S. citizenship in the past. We'll happily do so again in the future. We have plenty of time tonight, but we'll cover what we can about the sex trafficking uh, in particular. <laughs> but many U.S. citizens tend to think of themselves as pawns, and they're not pawns at all. They're dust bunnies. <laughs> you are basically lint on the chessboard, and the pieces that they're maneuvering simply brush you aside as the game is played. And uh, a lot of that lint uh, as far as the elite is concerned, is in the, the form of these disposable children. Now, we've talked a bit about the boys. That's the overworld that tends to exploit them. In terms of the underworld, that's where you get into the blue-collar crime of exploitation of girls. So the Department of Justice has identified um, as the top 20 human trafficking jurisdictions in the country, of all places, Houston, El Paso, Los Angeles, Atlanta, Chicago, Charlotte, Miami, Las Vegas, New York, Long Island, New Orleans, and Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia itself, Philadelphia, Phoenix, Richmond, San Diego, San Francisco, which would go without saying, St. Louis, Seattle, and Tampa, Florida. Now, um, when we are confronted with these cities, 
that's where my experience usually comes in with the date rape drugs that I superimposed out of assumption uh, on the situation that Chrissy McMahon was originally describing. But when you take a look at it from what I am more familiar with, which is the urban human trafficking, you become familiar with the horrifying statistic that one in three teens on the street will be lured towards prostitution within 48 hours of leaving home. Now, that's per the National Runaway Hotline. And that is because they're desperate to eat, desperate for a place to sleep, and there are people just lurking to pick them up and sweep them up and exploit them. And um, obviously, they are often told they'll be brought home to the pimp's family, and the family will turn out to be the three to six other girls that the pimp is exploiting. So uh, we want to approach this problem as a national problem, and uh, we want to approach it as a problem of slavery in the United States that was never solved by emancipation. <coughs> now, I'm going to take a break for just a second while go ahead. Uh, Chrissy McMahon <laughs> kind of emphasizes. Yes, Douglas, go ahead. Um, but, yeah. But, but at any rate, no, I'm, I'm, I'm back now. Okay. At any rate, one of the things that I do want to emphasize concerning the Emancipation Proclamation and its uselessness, it's important to remember that Abraham Lincoln very much uh, was not a, um, in any way, shape, or form a progressive uh, or liberal person who felt that there was any equality between the races. So when he declared the Emancipation Proclamation that, quote-unquote, freed the slaves, this was something that took effect only in the slave-owning states of the Confederated States of America or the southern states that had chosen to secede. Now, in the northern slave states, slavery was still legal under the Lincoln administration. And his ultimate intention was to deport all of the African Americans out of the United States, especially those that were freed in the South, and just ethnically purge and cleanse the United States of black humanity, period. So that was how the nation of Liberia was originated. You have an African republic that did not exist until the conclusion of the American Civil War between the states and the population of the nation of Liberia is entirely deported African-American slaves. The only reason that this stopped and the only reason we're not ethnically purged of African-Americans today is because a Confederate soldier blew Lincoln's brains out. And that's what stopped the deportation program. So you have an irony there of history. But what makes it so much more of an irony is you take a look at the fact that part of his um, freeing of the slaves, part of his strategy to undermine the South in his hopes to create a slave rebellion of their primary um, economic foundation stone, which was slavery, Part of that uh, drive to subvert was the gift of, quote-unquote, the right to vote. So he basically gave the African Americans voting rights that he hoped would soon wipe out the white population in the South by giving the blacks total control of the voting process. Now, he was ultimately going to ethnically cleanse all of them completely off the map as well but he was hoping they would eliminate the whites in the South first. This would leave all of the former Southern territories basically depopulated for the North to basically absorb and repopulate with their own population. Now, people might think, how could anyone think in terms like that? This is where the racism comes in, and it's an actual race war. The majority of the Southern white population was overwhelmingly gallo skeltic in its background. And these were people from Scotland, Wales, Ireland. This is why the Ku Klux Klan is basically a Southern rights masonry organization, uh, a kind of uh, Scottish Masonic Lodge, if you will. They use the Scottish rights of masonry in all of their rituals. That's where that comes from. Whereas the Northern states were overwhelmingly Anglo-Teutonic now, because they were Anglo-Teutonic in background, 
what America's Civil War was, was an extension of the Anglo-Saxon attempt to exterminate the Celtic fringe, just like the British had done on the British islands for hundreds of years in their attempts to exterminate the Scots, the Welsh, and, of course, the Irish. So that was what the American Civil War between the states was as a race war between the whites. And in that case, was the African-American population that was the lint, the dust bunnies that were not even pawns, but just in the way that were brushed aside whenever the pawns were moved. Now, when these blacks were suddenly raised to the point where en masse in the South, they were giving voting privileges, one has to remember that in the North, property-owning blacks who <coughs> excuse me yeah douglas take your time because um yeah. douglas just got over being very ill he was hospitalized and everything and the fact that he's even <coughs> here speaking with me today is an absolute miracle because um douglas's health has been poor f uh, for a long time um he was yeah. very kind to post on my birthday this beautiful uh, artistic uh what is it like a graphic artist uh, rendition of a woman um, glowing um, beautiful glowing woman in this horrendous sea behind her of blackness that um, can be you know the, the possibility of, of life as we know it but um, there's so many of us that are trying to, to make a change and and his dedication and his um, I don't know his just wonderfulness of <laughs> coming well, on here and doing this. This is like well, so you're, wonderful. You're, you're very kind and I want to thank you for that. Um, what she, uh, what Chrissy McMahon is referencing is of course on her birthday what I posted was a rendition to the best of my ability of a near-death experience that I had during uh, the time of my multiple lung collapses. My lungs are stapled to my rib cage because I was exposed to cyclosaurine nerve gas uh, as were many hundreds, if not thousands, of United States Marines when the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers blew Bunker 73 in Kamasaya on the front lines of the war in Operation Desert Storm. Now, uh, so enough of that got into my lungs uh, where the results have been obvious. And uh, recently, unfortunately, I caught the flu. And uh, whenever someone like myself catches the flu, since I'm at a baseline 30% of my original lung capacity, it's very similar to someone uh, who has been a lifetime chain smoker who catches pneumonia. Um, basically, a flu for me is a life-threatening illness. So uh, I'm at the, this is the last day of my antibiotic regimen. So, yes, I'm still uh, very productive of phlegm, and I want to appreciate everybody for their patience whenever I uh, collapse into those grotesque moments of uh, coughing. Uh, but to complete uh, my thought process about the near-death experience, we, I do hope we go into that a little later tonight because mm -hmm. it has a lot to do with how I was inspired in producing uh, that illustration for uh, Chrissy McMahon because of her work with the International Women's Explorers. Uh, which is, of course, a agency which is obviously trying to empower women and help them uh, basically get more of a, uh, shall we say, a respect in societies around the world so that they can help participate in uh, a life-positive fashion with uh, the way the world works, which Absolutely. unfortunately, you know, we have a very, very anti-feminine uh, global structure at the moment. Uh, anyone who doubts this, just take a look at the number of female prime ministers and presidents in the world around us. Uh, you'll find that at the top of the list would be uh, the uh, prime minister of United Germany, Angela Merkel, uh, a scientist who, along with, uh, shall we say, uh, the former prime minister of England, who is now uh, deceased, uh, Margaret Thatcher, was also a scientist. So you have two female scientists who were presidents of uh, or leaders of their nations. Now, until those two, uh, there were absolutely no other leaders of any nation state on earth historically that were scientists other than Emperor Hirohito of the Japanese Empire. So aside from those three people, uh, it really goes to a long way to showing you that not only um, can women be quality leaders, but those that become leaders are definitely 
able to withstand years of education, which is a discipline that most people do not have uh, to withstand. So, uh, but nevertheless, when you take a look at the females who are prime ministers or presidents, uh, Iceland has one, uh, some other nations, basically they constitute about less than 6% of the people who are officially recognized as leaders of nation states. So we have in no way, shape, or form a world in which women are participating in leadership. And this reflects pretty much the say that women have domestically the world over, basically around less than 6%. So we live in a world that is very anti-female. In the United States, it is far more leaning towards that condition than many people think. And um, I'm here tonight to help uh, put that in context. Uh, one of the things I was saying about President Lincoln and his fallacious Emancipation Proclamation was, of course, there were blacks before the Emancipation Proclamation who were men. They were black men who had bought their way into freedom. They had purchased their freedom with money that they had earned over decades of slavery, during which time they had conducted underground businesses or underground business dealings uh, with what little money they were able to save or scramble. And these black men, of course, purchased the right to vote. Because in the United States, well up to the point of the American Civil War, you could not vote unless you owned property. Most people are entirely unaware of that. Now, President Lincoln, strictly as an expedient of subverting the South, gives the African-American male population the right to vote, not the female population. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the 1920s, with the suffragettes movement, right. that women were able to get themselves the right to vote. Now, think of the context of American society that most people have never given a moment's thought to. This means that the elites, the white males who ran the United States, basically had originally set up this constitutional republic and gave only white property-owning, slave-owning males, the right to vote. Okay, no way, shape, or form of democracy. What you have is a constitutional tyranny of the Republican elite. And I'm not speaking of Republican in the political party sense. I'm speaking of those that constitutionally created the republic we live in today. Now, these creeps, and there's no other word for them, basically arranged so that they would dominate society to the point where society was falling apart, their society. That's what was happening with the American Civil War. At that time, they took desperate, literally apocalyptic measures, and they gave black men the right to vote. Now, black men at that time would constitute field hands, house hands, um, uh, overwhelmingly black men who were slaves, who were considered, until that point, less than human property. Now, these men, these creeps, were willing to give African-American men that they considered to be basically animals, less than human property, the right to vote, before they were willing to give that right to the woman that they slept with, to the right. woman that bore their children. That is how much they hated women. <laughs> that is how disgustingly misogynist your American culture is. Your American culture is beyond disgusting. It is loathsome, it, it, is, it is wretched, and it is no different than the Arabic cultures which I was describing at the beginning of this discourse, where you have men who keep women in harems, use them as nothing but breeding machines, turn them into practically human pigs by making them give birth to multiples through the enforcement of fertility pill regimens. Now, uh, every baby born in these developed Arab nations, like Kuwait, now, I just said how I got my lungs blitzed, was in Operation Desert Storm. Now, Chrissy McMahon is old enough to remember, since I just found out she's uh, old <laughs> enough to <laughs> be a grandmother. To remember. <laughs> <laughs> she's old shh, enough to remember, shh, and you can vouch for me on this, dear lady, do you remember that before we invaded Al Kuwait, that the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter was in the United States telling the American Congress uh, and the Senate, the House, 
uh, the Senate and House review hearings, all the rest of that going on about should America uh, invade uh, to counteract uh, our uh, Sadaim Hussein's invasion of Al Kuwait. And uh, one of the bits of evidence she brought up was she claimed, and it turned out to be entirely fallacious, she claimed that Iraqi troops were pulling babies out of their incubators and Oh, yeah, them on the floor. I remember that. Yeah, you give me chills. Yeah, yeah. oh, God. Yeah. Now, and that was, of course, a uh, PSYOP, a uh, psychological operation, yes. promoted by the Central Intelligence Agency, which, of course, George Bush Sr. had been the administrator of. And now he was president at that time, and he was using all of the CIA connections to recruit people like the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter to make up stories like this so that the American public would rally behind participating in a war that had nothing to do with them. Now, in terms of all of these babies, the incubator babies, no one ever asked, and did it ever occur to you, dear lady, or anyone in the listenership, why are there so many babies in incubators in Kuwait? Right. I mean, why would the Iraqi troops, if this really happened, why would they suddenly step into a matrix-like environment where apparently thousands of babies were in incubators, where they took hundreds of them out and were smashing them against the floor and uh, swinging them against baseball bats and all the horrible things this woman said they were doing. Yeah. Uh, why were there so many in these incubator banks in the first place? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because the overwhelming majority of babies, almost, uh, for all intents and purposes, almost all of them, that are born in developed Arab nations along the Gulf, on the Arabian Peninsula and Southwest Asia, uh, whether the House of Saud, or Al Kuwait, or Qatar, or any of these other uh, Emirates, the overwhelming majority of babies born are preemies. The reason they're all preemies is because of the fertility pill regimen. The fertility pill regimen forces a woman's eggs to subdivide aggressively, right. where she's given birth to multiple babies, but they're all preemies. So that's why every baby born in these republics, or uh, these so-called republics, these Emirates and these shakedoms, is a preemie, and they can afford it. They can afford the medical care to have them all put into giant incubator banks and raise them to a point where they're stronger. Some of them will die percentage-wise, but they don't care about that, and that's why they're the fastest-growing population on the face of the earth. That's why Islam is growing so astronomically in terms of numbers. It, Islam grows not even so much by conversion as it does by reproduction. Right. Now, this is the use of the human female as an incubator farm. It's the use of the human female as an animal, uh, breeding stock, and nothing else. The Americans, on the other hand, look at the uh, female as basically someone who is to be exploited for violent gratification. I'll go more into that as we go into this discussion, but it became most noticeable to somebody like myself when I was in Africa. And people were asking me about the rating system in American movies. And uh, they, first of all, were very friendly to me uh, because of my German last name. And um, Africans and people all over the world who are colored look on Germans as heroes because Germans had very few colonies as opposed to the British and the French and the Americans and the Soviets. Uh, German colonialism was functionally uh, non-existent uh, compared to that. Now, there were atrocities, there were colonial activities, but overwhelmingly, the German colonial experience, as far as the uh, colored and third world nations and the developing world is concerned, was a positive one. So once I found out my last name was Dietrich, my money was no good anymore. They gave me everything for free. This was in uh, uh, Uganda, uh, the former country that was, uh, the nation that was formerly ruled by Idi Amin Dada. Now, while I was over there, uh, people would ask me all kinds of things about America, like the rating system. What is this uh, rating system? Rated PG-13, rated R, rated X, all the rest of that. So I was explaining to them the um, absurd rating system in American media. I said, yeah, well, you've got this PG-13, which means that this is strong, this strong parental advisory. Uh, you've got this R, which means that it's incredibly violent or gory. Uh, and then you've got the X, which is sexual. And they just couldn't even believe what I was saying. They were saying, wait a second, the X is something only adults can watch, and this is the act of reproduction and love and mating? And I said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and they're saying, yet the children can go see these movies where people are getting chopped up and, and, and machine gun? And, right. and they, they said, whoa, you've you got to be making that up. They honestly didn't believe what I was saying. And I said, 
Uh, you no, know, it, it, it really is like that. Sex is considered, because Americans have this kind of puritanical uh, background, sex is considered far worse than violence. And so they're saying, so in these movies, you can cut a tit off, but you can't lick it. And I said, <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah, it's like that. And that's what they honestly at that point just thought I was nuts. No, I was just making this up. And then, you know, no. a lot of them would just disengage from the conversation. That is what America looks like to the rest of the world. And, and this is in Africa where violence is endemic. Right. So the, in, in terms of the kind of cultural insanity that we're dealing with, that should contextualize to the average American how warped, deranged, and demented their society truly is. And as for yeah. Native Americans, of course, uh, I myself am 12 to 14% Native American of the tribe of Mandan, I was always told. So Native Americans, of course, they were not given the right to vote until after World War II. <laughs> so you can imagine what it's like <coughs> to be alienated to that degree. <laughs> By well, the way, we're, coming, we're coming up to the top of the hour. If you like, we can take a five-minute break, and we have these lovely suggestions that you should take honey, <laughs> and you should talk <laughs> slowly, and these people love you, and they want to make sure you take care of yourself. So do you want to take a couple-minute break, and we'll come back? Yes, ma'am. I'm Thank sorry. You. I'm sorry to stop you, but we've got to rest your breath. Thank we'll be you, right man. back. You're listening yes, to Alchemical Connections. <laughs> You're listening to Awake Radio. Straight talk for the awake and aware. This is Chrissy McMahon, and we're back. Uh, you're listening to Our Chemical Connections, and my guest is uh, Douglas Dwayne Dietrich. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you, ma'am. I very much appreciate uh, the tolerance of both yourself and the listenership for um, uh, my health as it stands at the moment. And it, I do believe that uh, I will be getting better, but nevertheless... This is part of the rocky road to recovery, and uh, I'm just very blessed that I have uh, angels like uh, Chrissy McMahon and Carolyn Rose Greta, who uh, actually care enough about me, along with many other people in the listenership, to supply so many helpful suggestions and give me breaks to basically suck down and quaff uh, various amounts of tea and lozenges. <laughs> Absolutely. Take care of yourself. We need you. Oh, thank you. Now, um, to emphasize the uh, slavery situation in the United States, it's very important to remember that uh, we used to have, of course, the slave trade where shipments were brought uh, across the Atlantic from the continent of Africa, mostly. There were also the slaves that were Caucasian from Europe. For instance, there were very long and brutal religious wars on the continent of Europe between Protestants and Catholics in the West and between, of course, the Catholics and the or Byzantine Orthodox Church in the East. And this was amongst Christians themselves. When one group of those Christians would lose, such as the French Huguenots, who were essentially French Protestants in the nation of France, they were sold off into slavery into the United States, where many of them wound up as white slaves, and constituted one of the baseline populations of New Orleans and Louisiana. So um, Americans weren't just buying black slaves. They were also buying white slaves. They were also buying uh, Native American slaves, who also, of course, were conquered, enslaved, put on the market. So we have a uh, slave culture in the United States, which people think ended with the end of the American War between the states. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, Americans were lax with enforcing anti-slavery laws, which were, by the way, instituted prior to the American Civil War. Most people who study the war between the states are well aware of that. Uh, during that period of history, when slavers were still bringing in slaves to the southern states, they were the target of federal uh, arrest. So the United States Navy and the Coast Guard basically cooperated to try to intercept slave shipments into the United States. Now, during that period of time, uh, only one man, um, if I remember his name correctly, it was a Captain Hooker, was ultimately arrested and hanged for trading slaves in the United States. That tells you that in this culture, there was only one man 
who was ever arrested, tried, and hung for slavery, for basically trading slaves. Now, that in itself kind of shows you how uh, incredibly bizarre our American uh, culture is. And uh, as a matter of fact, the man's name was not Captain Hooker, it was Captain Gordon. So I apologize. I, 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 we need to use the mnemonic Flash Gordon, and then we'll remember that. Mm-hmm. But um, people can look his life up, and it stands as an example of how slavery was tolerated then, and that um, slavery is tolerated now. Now, what's the difference? The difference is that the slave ship has been replaced with the 747, and we bring in 17,000. 500 foreign nationals a year to traffic annually in the United States alone. Now think about what I'm saying. It's just an estimate. 17,500 foreign nationals trafficked annually in the United States. Now the number of U.S. citizens that are trafficked within the country, U.S. citizens, are even higher with an estimated over 200,000 American children at high risk for trafficking into the sex industry specifically each year. So it's important to remember that the overwhelming amount of slavery is sexual in nature. The overwhelming amount of people who constitute sex slaves in the United States are U.S. citizens. They're not foreigners because most of the foreigners that are brought in wind up as dishwashers, they wind up as busboys, They wind up in sweatshops. They wind up as field hands, migrant labor. But they don't usually wind up being sexually exploited. No, they usually use white boys and white girls for that. Now, we're concentrating on the white girls tonight because that's the sexual slavery which I have not concentrated on in media before. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, because my manager is Lorian Ann Fenton, deals with super soldiery, a horrible term, has nothing to do with the reality of the horror that these young boys are experiencing. Most of that is young boys being exploited. Most of that is overworld machinations, uh, gratification of the godfathers of the overworld. Concentrating on working class, blue-collar criminality tonight, most of the victims overwhelmingly are young girls. Now, three victims of, uh, I'm trying to remember specific examples, but um, I'll probably bring them up later if possible. It's important to remember in general that victims of trafficking come from vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. This can include uh, migrants. It can include uh, oppressive or marginalized groups, runaways, or displaced persons. But more than likely, they are poor. And it's important to remember that in terms of poverty, because Caucasians are still the majority in at least half the states of the United States. The overwhelming amount of of poor people, statistically, are white. So this is why you have much more of a white slave trafficking in this day and age than you do in colored peoples. So it um, is definitely a situation that um, 80% of the trafficked persons are women and children, um, men are sometimes the victim, uh, but they are mostly forced labor. So uh, it's the women and children that go towards the uh, sex industry. Now, uh, it's important to remember as well that we need to divide the sex industry into voluntary and non-voluntary. Now, I myself worked in the pornography industry as a commercial illustrator and later as a security enforcement agent. Now, what I was responsible for was originally just producing illustrations for pornographic literature, the covers of pornographic pulp, uh, just paperback books. Uh, That, as an industry, doesn't even exist any longer. Uh, People go online, and they find all the pornography that they want. Um, There used to be pornography shops where people would walk in, and they would see an entire wall full of pulp, just paperback books. And it used to be... In any major city, you could go to a train station, and in San Francisco, you could go to corner stores, and you would see racks, spinning racks, full of pornographic paper bags. And people would buy these, and they'd read them on the train when they were traveling, that sort of thing, uh, men traveling by themselves. So that industry, of course, required covers for the paper bags. So I started off as a pornographic illustrator that was illustrating such covers. 
working for the underground comics industry in San Francisco, which was enormous. Uh, the it was a national, uh, but it uh, emerged mostly out of San Francisco, where a lot of underground uh, drug and sex and occult centered comics emerge from. Now, in terms of later, when I got involved with the pornographic uh, adult entertainment industry and security, then I was responsible for escorting adult actresses, uh, pornographic actresses or strippers, uh, exotic dancers to their cars to prevent them from being ambushed on the way to and from work. Now, the overwhelming majority of these women were emotionally um, uh, mostly mature, uh, physically more mature. They were definitely... Uh, not children. They were 18 or over, and they seemed to have a fairly good handle on themselves. Many of them were young college girls who were just making an enormous amount of money while going through college. Uh, their family situations were not necessarily always even hostile or negative. So there's a difference between women who are working. Now, all porno industry is mob. It's all mafia. But nevertheless, the kind of mafia uh, organization that was dom dominating the pornographic film industry in Los Angeles and in San Francisco, the uh, stripping and the adult, uh, the exotic dancing industry, it was comparatively benign. They would take a cut, and uh, these women who were uh, doing the dancing, or the girls who were just 18 and over, they were not really exploited. They were well aware that there was fat kickback, and a lot of what they earned would uh, wind up going to the management or to the mob. But they basically got to keep um, uh, around half of what they were making. And they were making so much that half of what they were making was still an enormous amount of money. Douglas, so, can but, you answer a question for one of the uh, chat room? Uh, people, they would like to know underground comics industry. Could you explain that, please? Well, the underground comics industry uh, in the 1960s and 70s was very different from uh, the kind of industry we have today. Today's comic books, as they exist today, um, have a lot of independent publishing houses that tend to go broke or tend to get bought up by one of the larger uh, publishers. Uh, Dark Horse Comics no longer exists, but it produced a lot of very revolutionary uh, experiments in uh, interpreting uh, media franchises such as Aliens or Predators or The Terminator, etc., into comic book format. Uh, so the illustrated literature was beginning to mature in the United States, and it has at last matured to the point where it is somewhat comparable to the kind of graphic literature that has existed in Japan or in Europe for ages. And uh, in Europe and in Asia, uh, graphic novels or uh, comic books that are as thick as telephone books, the, the size of uh, your average printed novel in the United States, have always been the norm. So people have used this as a storyboard expression of artistic medium for a long time in those places. In the United States, they were just beginning in the 1960s when I was born, and 70s is when it exploded, to use illustrated literature as a form of expression for political agenda. So you had underground comics that were essentially drug-oriented, like the fabulous Furry Freak Brothers, uh, and uh, they were promoting the use of LSD, uh, marijuana. So these were like hippie comics. And many of these were occult-oriented in nature. Uh, Marvel Comics, for instance, produced an enormous amount of occult comics. They had lines of uh, superheroes and superheroines, if you could use that term, that were titled The Son of Satan or Satana, The Devil's Daughter. And kids would buy these comics. And you know, Can you imagine somebody trying to put a comic like that out today? <laughs> On a rack, if you can imagine... Son of Satan, and read about his latest adventures. Yes, his <laughs> mother was Rosemary. You well, know, they, made, uh, they made those co uh, movies. They had um, uh, Nicky, Little Nicky, and all kinds of crazy movies that um, they were well, comedies. Well, that, well, yeah, most of those were just like um, the equivalent of... Uh, Little Nicky was almost satire. It was basically comedic. But these were like uh, the equivalent of kind of like horror slasher films taken to um, just lampooning themselves. 
But in terms of the comics, these were very uh, serious comics. I mean, these like the Son of Satan and Satana, the Devil's Daughter. These were very moody, black and white adult comics. Uh, they were not really intended for children to read, but of course, children bought them all the time, mm-hmm. and uh, they were not pornographic. I, however, was illustrating pornographic comics before I was of legal age to buy them. That's because I grew up in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco. Now, San Francisco is the pornography capital of the world. So I grew up basically adapting to the local industry. And that's ultimately uh, where I made money enough to help my family relocate out of the Tenderloin. So there was no other way to really do that. Either that, or I would have been selling my ass as what the police would refer to as a queer whore, basically, right. tenderloin. So it's, it's one choice or the other. I took the creative way out. But uh, it needs to be emphasized to people that this is why so many of the young ladies go into uh, the sex industry. I mean, you're, you're left Because it's easier. These, mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you, you're, you're left in these areas of extreme uh, poverty where the choices really don't exist. So I do want people to understand that the um, pervasiveness of this kind of industry, uh, I'll give you an example. I attended John O'Connell Vocational Institute. Now, the original building which housed John O'Connell Vocational Institute, which was basically a high school which trained people in trade, you weren't supposed to go to a community college after graduating from that school. You were supposed to go into a professional business. Now, the trade that I majored in was commercial illustration. So I majored in graphic arts and uh, advertising. But really, all I was doing was pornographic illustration. So my high school teacher, Gary Willard Hambright, who was ultimately indicted by a federal grand jury for a number of assaults against children. As a matter of fact, he was indicted for no less than 14 assaults against children, all of whom were under four years of age. He kept all of his pornographic stash at the school with the, on San Francisco Unified School District property. All the other teachers were aware of it. They were overwhelmingly men because it was trade school. People called it San Quentin Prep. We had car yeah, shops. Yeah, I read that. <laughs> yeah, we I had read car that in your uh, biography, yes. That's yeah. horrible. Uh, yeah, sorry I went too far in that direction. Basically, no, uh, but, um, but one of the, uh, one of the uh, chat uh, people asked... What's the connection between the occult and trafficking? So I know that's what you're leading into, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, actually, in a very real sense, I'm not leading into that because we're not concentrating too much on the exploited boys. That's overwhelmingly where the occult factor comes in, is with the overworld. When the elites and the godfathers of the overworld are involved, there is an, a, there's a heavy occult factor Now, the difference is, back in the 1970s, when I was illustrating pornographic literature, covers, comic books, the occult had exploded into the popular consciousness. That's why you had Marvel Comics catering to that market. And Marvel Comics, which is, of course, the producers of Spider-Man, Thor, The Avengers, all that you see on the big screen today, um, all that they were doing in the 70s was what they're doing now, which is making money. The way they make money now is through movies. In those days, it was by catering to the popular explosion and awareness of occult interest. And so that's why they produce comics like Doctor Strange, the mystical hero, and of course, Son of Satan and Satan of the Devil's Daughter, etc. So these were uh, part of that explosion, and the occult was often factoring into my pornographic illustrations. And that, of course, is how I caught the eye of people like the satanic chaplain of the United States Army, Colonel Michael Aquino, because I was doing that, and then later on, when I got a job as a librarian's aide, was recruited to be his liaison. My reputation was known. So it's one of those things where my own childhood participation in the adult entertainment industry directly intertwined with the satanic underworld of the overworld, where you've got this military chaplain, a satanic chaplain, officially, officially recognized as such. The man who wrote the chaplain's handbook for the U.S. Army recruits me as his liaison when I'm working at the Department of Defense as a librarian's aide initially. So that's how all of that intertwines in my life. 
But in your average young late woman's life, who uh, young girl's life, young lady's life, who's exploited as basically a sex slave, the occult really doesn't play that much of a factor unless, heaven forbid, they wind up as a sacrifice in some kind of ritual, which is much more common south of the border in Mexico. And the women that they target for satanic sacrifice or ritual usually aren't even prostitutes. These are very poor, young, working ladies who are working for the maculadoras or the uh, startup companies that are burgeoning in, south of the border so that they can make cheap goods, uh, which they manufacture for the market in the United States and elsewhere in the world. <coughs> These women are often targeted on the way home or on the way to work, and they're abducted, and they're used in ritual hunts. They are hunted down like animals, and then they're butchered alive. Uh, that's what they're doing in Mexico. That is part of a ritual which has not yet, thankfully, started in the United States. But we're going to see more of that because the United States is getting an enormous influx of cultures from Latin America that it never had before. Thanks to the enormous expansion of the Puerto Rican culture, the Mexican culture, the Cubano culture, we're seeing an enormous growth in Valjaudu, or Voodoo, which is a religion of Pan America down south that is increasingly manifesting up north. Now, that is not necessarily in and of itself a satanic religion at all, but there are schisms and there are elements within that religion, as there are in any religion, which are dark and satanic. In other words, there are people who worship the satanic or the negative aspect of that cosmology, just as there are people in the North who are into Satanism, the negative aspect of what is basically the Christian cosmology. So this is all uh, kind of getting more complicated and uh, more hard to track because we're entering an area where statistics are often hard to come by. Well, uh, here I have another question that goes back to the Marvel Comics. They wanted to know, um, was, was it incepted in the first place to promote the occult, uh, predictive programming rather than simply profiteering on an emerging market? Well, that's a very good point, and uh, I can tell you that uh, I would say yes. <laughs> yes that's, and uh, there's not too much need to go into detail about that tonight. We could do another interview in the near future which would specifically talk about the occult and the attempt to promote the darker, negative, satanic, or diabolic aspects of the occult through popular culture. Now, in America, that's been going on for quite some time. The uh, first Church of Satan, as established by Anton Zandor LaVey here in San Francisco, and I know quite a bit about him. I attended City College of San Francisco after I attended the Vocational Institute, where I was supposed to learn a trade, go out and enter a trade without going to community college. That was impossible because I had graduated from John O'Connell. John O'Connell was so corrupt that they tore the building down. Uh, because of the scandals with uh, my high school teacher, Gary Willow at Hambright, uh, he died of AIDS during that trial uh, where he was indicted for assaulting all those children. If he had not died of AIDS in the midst of that trial, he would have been indicted uh, for assaulting hundreds more children than he was indicted for. Um, he was running the child daycare center at the Presidio Military Base of San Francisco, where I also worked as a librarian's aide. And uh, he, it is understood that he had molested literally hundreds of children because half a thousand children were maintained at any given time in the care of the United States Army at the child daycare center of the Presidio uh, daycare, you know, the Presidio military base. Now, uh, in the 1980s, at the time that the scandal went down, the United States Army alone was caring for 100,000 children on any given Day because they had bases all over the world. They had bases in South Korea, the Philippines, West Germany. They had bases in Panama. Uh, daycare centers at all of these bases for family members. Uh, so this is a nightmare that goes into mostly the super soldier phenomena that I speak with in conjunction with my manager, S. Laurie and Ann Fenton. Uh, 100,000 children being cared for a day by the U.S. Army. Now, I think there's one thing all of us can agree on. 
whatever else a military should be, a military should never be a family environment. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> That's not what a military is for. And what did they do? They wound up exploiting a lot of these children. I've gone into some detail about this concerning West Point when I was speaking with, uh, uh, I believe her name was uh, Reginald Meredith. Uh, have I got her? Regina Meredith. Regina. Of, yeah, I yeah. love her. <laughs> Yeah, she's wonderful of Conscious Media Network. And, yeah, um, which is no more. Oh, I'm sorry. Sad, to hear that. sad, oh, yeah. sad. Yes, well, now she's with Guy MTV. So That's she closed right. down her website, and she's with Guy MTV, which is a paid membership um, right. website. Right. Um, at any rate, um, hopefully I'll get a chance to conduct another interview with her sometime in the future. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, certainly, I certainly enjoyed our, our last one. Uh, at any rate, um, in terms of uh, what was going on with the U.S. military, that is a world in and of itself that leaks into uh, the political and the occult. But when we're talking about the young ladies that we are talking about, oh, yeah, let me complete my thought about um, Major Santon Sandor LeVay. I, uh, of course, went into school, uh, City College, Community College, City College of San Francisco, after graduating from John O'Connell, because it was impossible to get hired after graduating from John O'Connell. Its reputation was so negative that anybody uh, who graduated from John O'Connell usually went straight to jail. I mean, that's why they call it San Quentin Prep. They usually wound up knocking off gas stations or something. (laughs) And so uh, people were not hiring graduates from there. They've reestablished that that school, but it has a totally different building. The original building was totally demolished uh, because of the uh, Gary Hambright scandals and all the rest of that. But uh, they were covering up evidence, essentially, for the fact that an enormous amount of child pornography was being maintained on San Francisco Unified School District property. So, you know, that's a story in and of itself. But when I went to community college in San Francisco, I majored in criminology. Now, the same teachers who taught me uh, forensic photography uh, within the criminology uh, major at City College of San Francisco were elderly. They were just about to retire. They were the same people who had taught Mages Anton Sandor LaVey, the founder of the First Church of Satan, forensic photography. Because that's what he majored in, so he could avoid the Korean War era draft by becoming a forensic photographer for the San Francisco Police Department. He was also their advisor on occult crime. So, Major Anton Sandor LaVey, I learned as much from these guys about forensic photography as he had learned. And I learned quite a bit about him. I had never met him personally. Now, he established the First Church of Satan, and what did he do with popular media? He served as the eyes of the baby in the movie Rosemary's Baby. If you ever take a look at Rosemary's Baby, and uh, when she looks into the baby's eyes and screams at the end of the film, those eyes are the eyes of the founder of the First Church of Satan. Mm -hmm. And Colonel Michael Aquino, his participation in films, he dabbled in it, he uh, actually provided all of the occult rituals in the movie Asylum of Satan. So if you ever take a look at this cheesy, grade Z horror film, the Asylum of Satan, it's got a grade A occult ritual text provided by the satanic chaplain of the U.S. Army, Colonel Michelangelo Aquino, the founder of the Temple of Satan, the Temple of Set. All of this was established in San Francisco. San Francisco is, of course, if, if Satan has a home, this is it. And uh, the Temple of Set was founded here. First Church of Satan was founded here. Um, so you do have a popular participation towards proselytizing Satanism in American media. Nowadays, it's done through music videos. But in the old days, there's films like Rosemary's Baby, Asylum of Satan, Grindhouse movies, and, uh, and the people who participated in it are big names in the Satanic Underground or Overworld. Uh, Major Anton Zandor LeVay was more the fringe. He attracted a lot of actors and actresses. Um, he was very Hollywood, so he would be more almost like underground. Uh, he would be involved with mob, uh, as Hollywood was involved with, as pornography industry is involved with. Uh, Colonel Aquino is more involved with the overworld. These are the people who are more involved with the McMartin scandal and uh, scandals like that that get politicians involved. So all of it started right here in San Francisco, and now I'm here to tell you about it. And part of what I'm telling you about is, of course, the trafficking. It's an illegal industry. 
So finding out just how many victims uh, there are annually is difficult. Now, very conservative estimates say that about 15,000 people are trafficked in the United States annually, but uh, the reality is that the number is probably as high as 60,000 people, at least. Now, think about what I'm saying. That's in your United States. So it's reasonable to say that, uh, the, um, that one slave is too many. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, so when we go into uh, the statistics uh, locally, we are basing our statistics on basically emergency room care patients and the number of survivors who have escaped because of hospital intervention. The frontline defenders of slaves, the people who intervene in slavery the most, are emergency room medical staff and social workers. And uh, that's because slaves who are beaten to the point of near death are often dumped into emergency rooms by their masters and mistresses the way you and I would dump a dog or a cat we didn't particularly care for. And that's because a lot of people don't want to kill them because then you're left with a body on your hands that could get you in trouble, whereas if you dump them off in an emergency room, they become somebody else's responsibility. They become basically the responsibility of you and I, the state, because we're paying for public access to emergency rooms. And at that point, they fall into the hands of social workers who are responsible for finding them new homes. Now, all of this has led to the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2005. And most uh, law enforcement agents are somewhat familiar with it, which means that your local constabularies have had to come to terms with the reality of human slavery and trafficking in the United States. So once a trafficking victim is identified, um, there's several things that can happen, uh, all of which depend on what the adult survivor wants. In an emergency setting, uh, the patient is identified as a trafficking victim, and then the care provider, meaning the hospital emergency room staff and social worker, calls a help hotline. Actually, that's how they get the, help, the social worker involved. And then it's up to the victim to decide whether or not they want to escape because many of them are broken into a dependency pattern, as you described with these young ladies. These young ladies who get pimped out become utterly dependent on the concept of a man to dominate them and tell them what to do. Now, this is the difference that I was trying to emphasize between actual slavery and a professional sex worker. Now, as someone who's been involved in the pornography industry, I can actually assert, and I'm not how do I say, I'm not effusing and I'm not promoting this, <laughs> I'm not recommending this, but I can tell you that there is a difference between a forced prostitute and an escort. There are professional escorts who are women who are entirely in control of their own lives, who are working with other women in escort agencies. Now, these women have basically, there's something similar to what happened in Africa. I'll give you an example. When I was in Africa, by the way, I don't want to make Africa sound like some kind of utopia. <laughs> I don't want people to mistake what I am saying. They have their share of problems. They have enormous problems. But the difference between prostitution in Africa and the United States, I'll give you an example. When I was over there as a mercenary in the Horn of Africa, at that time, to my eternal shame and disgrace, I was too busy with other things to remember the name of it. At that time, during the Clinton administration, there was a U.S. aircraft carrier which ported in, um, oh God, I think it was Somalia. And uh, I was inland. I was in Kenya. So it might have very well have been Kenya. But it was in area. And an aircraft carrier is essentially a floating city. So when that ported in area, you would have thought every single professional sex worker on the continent of Africa had emerged out of the forest to cater uh, to these sailors who were in town. So we're talking about thousands of sailors, uh, tens of thousands of professional sex workers. And it was at that point that I became fairly familiar with professional sex work in Africa in terms of my exposure to these women who were coming in to cater to the American sailors, both black and white, and, and whatever ethnicity these American sailors were, including many American female sailors 
who oftentimes were um, either lesbians or had picked up an attitude of lesbianism because they really learned to hate men on those ships. Mm. <laughs> and uh, so in terms of what I learned, in Africa, most of the time throughout the continent of Africa, professional sex work is women who are mothers, who have no drug addictions, and they're basically earning money to send their children through college, through higher education. Now, this is a totally different phenomenon from what was the norm in the United States at the time I was in Africa. In the United States, the overwhelming majority of professional sex workers are drug addicts. Now, these are the voluntary, mature sex workers as well as those who are into forced sex exploitation. Those young ladies who get forced into sexual exploitation by pimps are often addicted to drugs because the pimp wants them totally dependent on him. So they are dependent to he on him as their drug source, and that is why they constantly come back home to him, so to speak, to bring him money in exchange for drugs. So they're addicted to drugs at a young age. Now, on the other hand, you have many professional escorts, strippers, pornography actresses, adult entertainers, who are their own free agents, usually cooperating with other women in a network, but they have drug issues and their own drug addictions. Certainly at the adult entertainment centers in San Francisco, where I worked security escort for so many of these strippers, they were addicted to drugs, and their major source of purchase was not the mafia, which was just getting its 50% cut from their stripping. It was the San Francisco Police Department. You'd have all kinds of policemen who would come in to, or firemen, or paramedics, EMTs, emergency medical technicians, who would come in, bring in drugs they had confiscated from street dealers or had picked up from patients uh, or basically people that the ambulance, the uh, fire departmental vehicle was transporting. They'd take these drugs and they'd sell them to the strippers in the adult entertainment centers. So you had law enforcement as the major drug dealer to make most of these strippers in San Francisco. Now, you had there a voluntary relationship where the woman got the drugs, they gave money to these blue-collar mafias, uh, cops, firemen, paramedics. They don't exist anymore, by the way, in San Francisco. What you have is the paramedical or the EMTs were all absorbed by the fire department. Mm -hmm. So now you've just got this duopoly between the fire department and the San Francisco Police Department. Now, I can guarantee you, when I was doing security at these adult entertainment centers, these strip joints in San Francisco, we had periods of time when the majority of people in the audience were firemen, policemen, and paramedics. <laughs> that, yeah. how, that was how the situation basically came down to. These guys were spending on-duty hours, on-duty hours, I need to emphasize that, in full uniform, going to these areas and going inside, hanging out, watching the show. They were the only ones who could afford it. Keep in mind... People don't just walk into a strip joint and pay some money and watch people strip, a woman strip on stage, or men, because we have Knob Hill and various other kind of uh, gay uh, strip joints in San Francisco. That goes without saying. I, fortunately, was working mostly in the heterosexual uh, industries. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was only when I was on uniformed security that I wound up working with the gay industry, in which I was basically uh, serving armed security at some of these gay orgies or parties, which were quite common in San Francisco. Different subject entirely. And that had to be a, a very unnerving and just, you know, another eye-opening experience. But in terms of when I was working with the females, the... Um, the drugs, the policemen, all of the stuff that was involved. You know what? I lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, you're, you were talking about the, um, the who who was really running the, uh, the the strippers and who the mafia was, the blue well, well, the mafia was. and the. It, and they had a relationship of understanding with law enforcement right. where the strippers were basically free agents and uh, they had their own habits to support. And that was the primary cause of uh, their turning towards this industry. Uh, they were making a lot of money. They would uh, spend a lot of money and, in the end, would wind up not saving a lot of money and so would be essentially doing this all of their lives. But the important 
thing was that they were conscious of what they were doing and they were voluntary. Now, we're gonna, the, the reason I want to make this difference so um, obvious to the listenership is because we're going to get more and more of the voluntary sex workers, uh, and they need to be recognized as a kind of subculture of their own. And they need to have, for instance, potentially protection or um, safety, some kind of union develop. Uh, and that is why um, you have these movements towards the state government in California trying to enforce safety precautions on the pornography industry, etc., like that. Now, I'm not saying that that's something that they themselves want, and I'm not advocating for that, and I'm not advocating or refusing for the sex industry, but I was trying to make the difference known. Because now, like Africa, as America's economy begins to spiral and collapse, we're going to get more and more mature women voluntarily going into the sex industry. So there needs to be a difference that's articulated between that and between young girls who are exploited. So I guess that was essentially the point that I was uh, going through. Well, let me I ask a question. Do you think it's possible that, like uh, marijuana, which is everybody's very hopeful that that will become legalized, do you think sex uh, for prostitution, I don't know any other way of saying it, will become legalized? Well, that would be a positive in my opinion because that would at least lead to a lot of uh, protection of rights for people who are in that industry. Now, the problem is that that would also eliminate a lot of freedom for those that are currently uh, voluntarily participating in that industry because that will lead to government enforcement of safety regulations, etc. Mm -hmm. And basically, Uncle Sam becomes the pimp. Now, this <laughs> happened with, yeah, that, well, this actually happened with Mustang Ranch in Nevada. In mm -hmm. Mustang Ranch in Nevada, you had all of these women working as prostitutes where prostitution is legal in the state of Nevada, which was, of course, built from the ground up by the mob. So, um, by the way, gambling is considered a sport uh, in the United <laughs> States. And, and, and gambling, because it's considered a sport, gambling is considered the major money-making sport in the United States. Yeah, I, mean, I would you put, imagine. Mm -hmm. yeah, you put, yeah, you put football, you put baseball, you put all of it together, and it doesn't even hold a candle to the amount of money involved in gambling in the United States. So the United States has always tried to keep its finger in the pie with gambling, which is why you have all these states approve lottery. So that's, since that's a sport, you get your average person participating in buying a lotto ticket. He's considered an athlete. Now, this is all absurd, but this is part of the government getting its cut into lottery. And the money they make off of these lottery tickets is so astronomical that it's nothing compared to the amount of money that's awarded to the lottery winner. The lottery winner, he wins like five, six, seventeen, 17, with Powerball, 20 million bucks. That's like a spit in the bucket compared to the amount of money that's going to the state governments. I mean, right. they are funding themselves off of this. I know. So, Where's all the money the, going? <laughs> Carolyn so, said that Uncle Sam went broke. Um, they couldn't even run a whorehouse. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. That's what happened with Mustang Ranch. Mustang Ranch is private, once again. Um, I believe it's still in operation. My last time I checked, it's in operation. It's private, once again, because Uncle Sam could not run it. They got so much paperwork involved. They were trying to test them for STDs, etc. Uh, they just couldn't work it. They just couldn't do it. So if they legalize prostitution, the best that they can do is take a hands-off kind of attitude towards it, and allow the state to become the pimp, <laughs> but I mean the local 50 states, the way they've done with lottery. Right. So since we don't have a national lottery, we do not have a national Powerball, a U.S. federal government Powerball lottery, we don't need one with prostitution. So, however, <laughs> I have always insisted that there is a solution to this police corruption, and that would be the organization of a United States police force that would be all female and the reason <laughs> that i believe that that's a, is that one of your dreams <laughs> well only being this, facetious, this, you know that. It, it, yeah i understand but this is this is why i bring that up um our local constabularies our regional constabularies obviously what i described is a preeminent example of corruption of those constabularies where they are basically interacting with the mob in this kind of uh balanced relationship 
where the adult entertainment industry is concerned. So the mob asks them not to arrest these strippers, not to raid these strip joints. In return, they become one of the major clientele. That was the point I was going to make. Now I remember right. it. You walk inside of a strip joint, you don't just pay an entry fee and watch strippers. You have to continually shell out money, and then they lap dance. And the laws are against prostitution. So theoretically, I, as security, one of my jobs was to constantly make sure that prostitution was not going on during business hours between the strippers and the clientele on which they were lap dancing, etc. <laughs> Just uh, we don't need to go into the gory details of that. It goes without saying that you'd have the cops and the firemen basically um, screwing these young ladies or the older ladies all the time. And prostitution was going on all the time. And obviously, I was not going to bust a cop or a fireman or a paramedic uh, because that would be something that would cause an enormous amount of dissension between them and the blue-collar mafias and the mob, which was running the facility. So I would leave them alone to do all the prostitution that they wanted when it came to individuals like that while trying to prevent it with normal citizenry. See, that is the horrible reality of that industry. But it costs an enormous amount of money to enter one of these facilities. People don't just walk in, you know, like people are on the bus and they see guys walk into these facilities and they assume this guy's paying 20 bucks or something, like he's seeing a movie. No, to enter a stripping facility, an adult entertainment facility in San Francisco, you're paying like $200, $300. And so this isn't something that men do on their lunch hour uh, unless you're a cop or a fireman or a paramedic, because you're making so much money, you can afford to do that on your lunch hour. But no one else can afford to do that. So your average man is like truly an addict who's going to these places, and he's spending hundreds of dollars to go in. He has to pump money constantly to these women to get them to go near him. So when you go to one of these places, you're spending easily half a grand, uh, easily, if not more. So the men who are going to these places are um, literally fairly well-to-do men. These are businessmen. These are uh, usually tourists. These are usually wealthy tourists from highly developed nations. And very often, more often than not, there's not many local people in your major cities who can afford to go to these establishments. So these are high-money establishments. Uh, the money's rolling. This is why the women volunteer for this kind of service. So that's the thing that I was trying to emphasize. Now we go on to the level where they're not voluntary, <coughs> and that's where we come into police corruption. That's a very unfortunate, very real phenomena, and uh, it's one of these uh, negative aspects where people are scared of police, uh, they become uh, mistrustful of institutions, and uh, these are the very institutions that are supposed to be protecting them and are supposed to be helping this is because police receive payoffs from traffickers to look the other way. So providers uh, who are in hospitals, care providers, uh, health care providers in the emergency rooms are not always aware of who can be trusted in their local police departments. For that reason, emergency room health care providers are advised by experts like myself not to call the police when they identify a trafficked person. They have to call social work help hotlines, like the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. That, those are the people who will know what to do, and they know who to trust in law enforcement. So health care providers in emergency rooms need to assure their patient, who is basically a victim that they're rescuing, that the police will not be called without their permission. So they have to tell them that they're calling a social worker, the social worker should know who to call, who to trust, but the people that they cannot turn to are the blue-collar mafias, the fire department, the emergency medical technicians, or the police. You cannot turn to them for all the reasons that I've been articulating over the past 15 minutes. Right. Now, um, now this is, of course, going to be taken uh, quite negatively by a lot of the listenership, but this is the reality of the world in which you live, where well, you've got... I've been given a bunch of, uh, of links today by a gentleman, um, K uh, Keith, K-I-F, Kif Davis, yeah. Davis, and he, um, most of the links were specifically about police officers that uh, committed suicide, supposedly, because they were accused of 
of either it's some kind of child pornography or some kind of sex acts with children. So, um, it, I mean, it's being exposed, but it's at a, such a limited, you know, it's it's limited. I don't watch mainstream television, so I don't I don't actually get to see anything like this. And if it doesn't come over the internet, or it doesn't come on a YouTube or something, I'm 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 basically in the dark when it comes to this uh, specific issue. I've seen a lot of this in movies. I've seen a lot of the sexual exploitation, sex trafficking of women in the, in different movies. I think the last one I saw was a James Bond movie uh, where they were bidding the highest bidder for, for these women that they, they just stole them and drugged them. So, I mean, that's my concept of the sex trafficking. But I know that Wait. there's all these different aspects, and I'm so grateful for you uh, taking us down this road and, and laying the foundation for an understanding of, of what we're talking about. Well, no, I, I very much appreciate that. And it's also important to remember that uh, while I was taking care of my parents for over 10 years, over a decade, about 11 years, during, unfortunately, what turned out to be the terminal decade of their lives, as a care provider and an advocate for senior uh, patients, I was basically their medical historian, I took uh, an entire um, set of lectures over that period of time in medical journalism. So I have the credit equivalent of a master's degree in medical journalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the perspectives that it gave me was that human trafficking is a disease. That's why it's so important that emergency care providers uh, who are essentially the front line of defense for trafficking victims their role in the anti-trafficking movement and in treating a trafficked patient or victim that they're rescuing is understanding that the emergent issue which causes the patient to present uh, is only a symptom of a disease, and that is human trafficking. Uh, it's in the same way that victims of intimate partner violence need to be removed from a dangerous living environment. Trafficking victims need to be separated from their trafficker. So just as providers understand that fatigue, mental confusion, shortness of breath, and pruritus may be symptoms of kidney disease, we also need to acknowledge that cigarette burns, ligature marks, depression, malnutrition, these all might be symptoms of human trafficking. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this is because victims of human trafficking don't admit to human trafficking themselves because they're scared to death not only of their traffickers, but of their local constabulary or police department, which aids and abets those traffickers. So merely treating the symptoms of kidney disease doesn't serve the best interests of the patient slash victim, uh, nor does treating the symptoms of human trafficking, but sending the patient back home treat the disease of human trafficking. As a disease, it must be considered as a differential when a patient presents to the emergency ward with certain symptoms. So we have a situation that is basically a pandemic situation. So what would be the solution in terms of how we deal with a national pandemic? By the way, uh, within the borders, you refer to it as an epidemic. When you refer to it as crossing national boundaries, then it's a pandemic. That's the same way with diseases as with uh, the phenomena like human trafficking, which is, of course, the most common form of modern-day slavery. Um, the kind yes. of estimate when we're uh, keeping track of it, uh, we place the number, uh, both domestically and internationally, uh, in the number of millions, mostly females and children, uh, enslaved for the commercial sex industry for little or no money, and uh, basically, it usually conjures up images, and rightly so, of young girls beaten and abused in faraway places like Eastern Europe, Asia, or Africa. Now, increasingly, the center focus for all of this is Israel. But human trafficking and uh, sex slavery happens locally in the United States, cities, towns, large and small, right in citizens' backyards. So that's why there was a book that came out recently titled The Slave Next Door, which talks all about the phenomena of slavery, but in a far greater spectrum. They talk about people who are exploited, of course, as sweatshops, field hands, 
um, an enormous amount of them, foreigners, shipped into the United States to work in domestic industries. So that is more of a universal book. It doesn't specialize in human sex trafficking. So when we think of that, people think of all of the popular uh, misconceptions, the movies, the television uh, tropes depicting pimps dressing in flashy outfits, driving very large, fancy land yachts. Uh, more importantly, they think of the woman as adult, consensually and voluntarily engaged uh, in the business of prostitution without complaint. And this is why the media has become the biggest ally of the exploitationists of involuntary sex professionals, mostly children. Uh, it's extremely inaccurate. It's nothing more than fiction. Very different from what I'm describing as voluntary, mature adults who are basically deciding whether or not they're exploited and are deciding that they are not exploited. And these are usually women's network facilities. By that I mean women who are networking amongst themselves in the professional escort industry. In the reality of the underworld, unlike media's glamour job on this, which actually sells it and promotes it, this is why media is so male-dominated. Uh, it used to be in the old days that there was what was known as a casting couch. And the casting couch is where women would sleep with the director and the producer and ultimately get their career going in media. Now, the entire media has changed, but it's no less misogynistic. Whereas before, we had this real heavy, old-world Jewish emigre dominance of Hollywood, what we have today is a lot of Scientology cultism and a lot of homosexual lobbying. Now, neither one of these interest groups have any empathy or sympathy with victimized women. So they tend to project an image of women liking to be prostitutes, that they're voluntary as opposed to the exploited population that I spoke of. Now, a lot of young women look at this, and they think that there's no danger in being a prostitute. Now, a professional escort, like the kind that I mentioned that are mature, that are adult, these are the female versions of a male assassin. A male mercenary, which is what I was for a while, is basically a prostitute who's prostituting his body out for killing or for war. A professional female escort is on that level of real hardcore uh, scar tissue on her soul, where she's basically not emotionally bonding with any of these men that she's renting her body out to, any more than a professional mercenary bonds in loyalty to whichever nation state hires him as a professional soldier. So these women are extremely hard, they're extremely professional, and they're extremely emotionally detached. Very different from what is portrayed in the media, these hookers with the hearts of gold, that gets these young children into thinking that this is a viable alternative for them. So the media, under the new lobbies of the gay lobby, the Scientology lobby, um, still traditional aspects of the Jewish lobby that used to dominate media. Any one of those interest groups really doesn't sympathize with women at all and apparently does everything they can, I think obviously does everything they can, to promote um, an exploitation of women in which the women look like they're enjoying it. So part of our problem is we've got to really assault media or prevent children from looking at conventional media which is something that I'll take a break from for a second. I'll let you do Right, absolutely. And I was just thinking, what well, wonderful analogy. Professional uh, mercenary to a professional escort or a woman who sells her body for sex. On a, on a professional level, does it consciously, does it, as you said, in a network, um, these are professional women. These are, are not uh, kids that are doing drugs and trying to support their habit. Um, just, you know, self-loathing and just want to feel good and probably high half the time and being used and beat up by whoever, whatever, in the hands of the receiver, um, you know, there there is a difference. And um, and absolutely with media, there um, it's awful. And it's, and it's been, uh, I guess I've been watching uh, Democracy Now! on free speech television 
one channel that I actually enjoy when I turn the television on when I try to get away from those cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have two year olds that I babysit, so I'm constantly watching Dora the Explorer and <laughs> some of these other fun shows. So, you know, I, I when the TV's still on, I'll flick the channel and I'll and I'll go to free speech television so, and link. But other than that, I I try to avoid um, most other shows. And they've actually had some pretty interesting programs. And and at the Sundance, uh, I guess their award ceremonies, they um private um I, it was about domestic abuse. It was a private something. Uh, the show was called. They they won a lot of awards, and it was about these women who had survived domestic abuse. And and it's not just within families, but in in the 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 manufactured family of the pimp and the and their their wards or whatever you call them. The the their their chattel. Um, mm-hmm. The sex slaves. So, um, it, it, and and how addictive it is for the woman to even get out of that situation. So they they're not only maybe addicted to the drugs, but then they're addicted to uh, being in the relationship with an abusive person, maybe because of their family of origin, or just because of that system is so ingraining into the psyche of the person that they don't think they can get out. Plus, they're being told they'll they'll be killed. If they ever right. leave or whatever, so it's uh, it you know it's such a devastating and and we have no support systems in place on on a governmental national. level, yeah. national level. The police uh, do not handle this properly. Um, the the word the woman used that they just have a culture that is just not geared to think of women, as you said, um, to be protected. The women, if a woman comes in and reports a rape. She's more or less told that it's her fault. And I've had experience of that, too, with my first husband. Um, before we got married, I was working at a pizza shop, and I was fondled by the, the owner. Um, I told him that I basically I was a kid. I was 16, 17 years old, and my mother was moving to Florida. She sold her house because I was into drugs, and she was leaving. I mean, that, that was her way of dealing with it. And um, fortunately, I you know, was with my husband at the time before we got married, and I was working at this pizza place, and he had apartments uh, above the the pizza uh, establishment, and he was taking me around looking at them, and I was so stupid. I mean, I'm, I didn't even know what dogs were doing at 15. I had no idea. I just didn't have that kind of mentality. And um, when he did that, I ran to the corner. There was a magic shop around the corner that the, the people had come in and I had become friends with. And just told them what had happened. And they were really kind and nice to me. But when I went home and told my future husband, he more or less made me feel like, well, look at the way you're dressed. And I had a tank top with spaghetti straps. Because I was working at a sweltering pizza shop. No, I understand. (laughs) You know what I mean? And 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 I'm not like well endowed. I'm not a huge breasted woman. So as a child... You know, uh, 15, 16, um, and I consider them to be children, I, although they're adolescents, whatever. Uh, I, I had no idea, and I just accepted that. I accepted that kind of response from him because th- I trusted this person. This was the person who, you know, was, you know, to be responsible soon. We got married soon after that. But, I mean, this is how I started my life <laughs> and, and the, the crazy way that you think. And my mother... Um, who's still alive? She's in her 80s, so she's always been very active in 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 public service and activism. Um, she taught in, in a a woman's college in Vermont. I forget the name off the top of my hand, ha- head, but uh, she taught uh, courses in in just that uh, abuse and how difficult it is. And she's the one who told me for a woman to get out of that situation. And uh, you know, I I I know that. It's it's probably not common for people to even understand that because you always look to blame the victim. I learned that in sociology as, as an undergrad. That's the culture that we live in. If somebody's doing something wrong, it's probably their fault that this happened to them because they should have known better. They should have right. done something that's, that's, differently. Right. That's the difference between uh, Western civilization and Eastern civilization is in the West you have a guilt culture as opposed to the East, where there is a shame 
culture. Now, both of them have their advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, in the West, there's far more of an individualistic approach, and that's why they look on everyone as responsible for what happens to them. But it's been taken to pathological extremes. It's been taken to pathological extremes first by a puritanical uh, genesis of American culture in particular, because the Puritans, the Quakers, the Shakers, the Mennonites, who established basically a theocracy on the North American continent hundreds of years before there was a constitutional republic, Mm -hmm. these people uh, were so extreme in their religious fundamentalism that they couldn't be tolerated in Cromwell's England. Now, Cromwell's England uh, fought a theological war against the monarchy, and Oliver Cromwell ordered regicide, the, uh, the, the execution of his own monarch, his own regent, his own king. So these people were hardly progressive or liberal in their view of the world. These were Puritans. These were theological fanatics. And yet they had amongst their own uh, population people who were so extreme in, this is why they called them Quakers and Shakers, they would fall into ecstatic, orgasmic kinds of communions with the divinity that were deemed uh, insane, uh, possessed (laughs) by the public norm. And so they were basically kicked out of the country, and they uh, made it across the Atlantic uh, by hiring captains who would take them uh, to uh, Plymouth Rock, as we always say in popular culture, and uh, established a theocracy of their own ilk over here, and uh, wound up basically providing us all of the puritanical insanities which promote the kind of victimization of the feminine in particular that we see today. These are the people who had the witch hunts and accused uh, young ladies of being witches, and they would put them on trial where they would torture them until they confessed. And once they confessed, they would burn them alive at the stake. So they were trapped as females in a no-win situation where they're accused of witchcraft, tortured until they confessed, then burned alive. All of this is gratuitous entertainment for the male-dominated patriarchy that established the theocracy on which our constitutional republic was ultimately based. And the constitutional republic, of course, was started by a bunch of deists, not at all Christian. Uh, These were Freemasons who believed in deism, a totally different cosmology, the cosmology of a clockwork universe uh, made by by a god gone away. In other words, the divinity created our universe and basically left it. And therefore the deists, the Freemasons, believed that they could fill, take his role, take his place, take over the universe, make it run, and uh, that is the kind of people who started the kind of overworld, the government, which uh, uses the kind of pedophile uh, exploitation that uh, manifests itself at places like the McMartin Preschool, at places like the Presidio Daycare Center. And um, that's a different subject, but in terms of what we're speaking about tonight, we're talking about a uh, society in which victims, and what happened to you was terrible, but at the same time fairly innocuous, comparatively speaking. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, but we're talking about... I mean, I could have beat him up. He was just this little, I don't even know what, uh, I was, I, Mexican I, I was, or something. I don't know what he was. Uh, he was this little was, guy. He was, like, came up to know, my nose, and I could have knocked oh, him God. out. But oh, yeah, I, I didn't, and my, I was so shocked at, that I ran. I, you know... <laughs> I was 15 or 16 years old. I, I, I had no concept of, of uh, you know, how to even, because, well, I was raised in an abusive family. My father was right. physically abusive, so I, you know, would never turn around and beat my dad. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like something like that. I, I wasn't, I was raised to be submissive and to be, you know, to do what a man the- says. This is part of the social conditioning for putting right. women into the victimization role. This right. is why I think it's so important to ultimately establish, reestablish, first of all, the draft. Only this time, the draft, draft is women. not <laughs> for not yeah for men into the military, but rather the draft should be for any female of legal age who is, does not have religious objection or some kind of physical disability or uh, developmental disablement that prevents her from serving. The draft should be universal, should be national, should be 
every female who comes to the age of literally, I would say, 16, because people are being exploited at the age of 12 and 13. So you might as well start it as young as possible. I would say 16. At that age, they could physically carry a gun. All of these women should be drafted into a United States police force to replace the National Guard, which has been torn to pieces anyway. The National Guard and the Reserve have been used literally to death by our wars in Southwest Asia. Not Southeast Asia, the Asian wars of our fathers, of my father. He was a veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, but rather the new Southwest Asian wars in Afghanistan, throughout Iraq. These have chewed up America's National Guard, so we don't even have a National Guard to help the population during hurricanes like Sandy or Katrina. And so why not make a new National Guard, United States Police Force, all females drafted, they learn to fire a firearm, they learn to uh, conduct riot control operations, they essentially are brought in for a year of three months training, nine months service, just like childbirth, and during this period of time, <laughs> what is born is essentially a woman who has some idea of self-empowerment and self-defense. Mm-hmm. Now, that's my view of a United States National Police Force. Now, they're all drafted into this in general. They're fed, they're clothed, they're professionally trained. Any number of them are going to want to make this a career. That is where you will get a career United States Police Force that basically provides the officer court for the upcoming generations of young women. Now, ultimately, these women, a great deal of them are going to become pregnant. They're going to raise children, and these children will be raised by mothers who have served in this domestic occupation army that answers to national disasters, hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, uh, various earthquakes. Uh, These women are going to be needed everywhere. It's not like they won't have anything to do. Now, the important thing is they'll learn about community service. They'll become aware of all these different parts of the United States, which are vastly different from each other. They're practically foreign countries. They will uh, basically develop a sense of maturity in which they can decide what they want to do with their lives, whether they're going to stay with this National Police Department, go into some other kind of professional work, become a doctor or a lawyer, or, as I was saying, based on uh, how our economy is going down the tubes, uh, they could become professional sex workers, but obviously far more along the lines of the escorts, which I've been describing, as opposed to these victimized children. As a matter of fact, part of their duties will be as a female police force on a national level to combat human trafficking. Since we don't have any uh, police department regionally or nationally that is doing anything about it effectively. Right. Now, what, so, you know, this idea needs to be propagated, needs to be promoted, it needs to be put into a petition, and it needs to be presented to the United States government. Now, this would also do an enormous amount for our economy. You would have all of these young ladies who are trained, educated, and at least for a year of their lives, employed. So you get them off the streets and into part of a national effort, a mobilization, to fight the moral equivalent of war. Now, I think that this is a brilliant idea, if I say so myself, if I can pat myself on the back. <laughs> of course, of course. It, it, well, what is your opinion on this? Well, I, I, I'm kind of thinking, well, does it have to be a draft? Couldn't it just be a voluntary? And is, doesn't Obama already have something in place where he wanted to, or did he, was it, that just a lot of talk? Because I try not to pay too much attention. But <laughs> did, didn't, he want to, didn't he want to have some kind of... Uh, like they have in Israel, uh, they're 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 kind of conscripted into service for a year there, there, or whatever it is. There, there were all these talks about the um, use of children, uh, kind of like these teen uh, uh, kind of police forces. Uh, it, it's all a joke. All of this is a lot of fear mongering on the part of people who are in alternative information media. Uh, the United States government is quite emasculated. It's quite eviscerated. Uh, To put it into perspective, as I've done so many, many times, uh, the United States military, you put together the National Guard, you put together the reserves, you put together all the branches of service, including the Coast Guard, the Marine Corps, uh, and what do you get? You get basically less than 1% of the U.S. population. Now, granted, that less than 1% of the U.S. population gets well over half of 
the fiscal discretionary income of the United States every year because of the super expensive weapon systems, uh, drones, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, multi-billion dollar, not multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar ships and submarines and all the rest of that. But the amount of people who are involved is minuscule. This includes 100,000 civilian bureaucrats who are out of uniform that serve in the Department of Defense. You still have less than 1% of the population. What I'm talking about is if you're drafting, every girl has to be a draft. It can't be volunteer because most women, uh, excuse me, females of a young age, 16 to 17, in these troubled uh, times of their lives, are never going to volunteer to serve in some national police department. <laughs> but they will respond to a draft. If they face jail, as opposed to that, they will opt into it. See, the Americans are programmed not to be joiners. They're programmed to think, I'm an individual. I can handle myself. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. The majority of Americans are totally incapable of handling themselves. We have to recognize the fact that the individual is truly dead. We're in an age where your average individual is totally incompetent. And most of these girls are incompetent. They're incompetent just as the boys are incompetent. Most of these boys are capable of nothing other than appalling levels of violence and predation. And the girls are, of course, incompetent because they've been programmed into being submissive victims to do as you did. You take an elephant, which is capable of crushing a man, and you chain it to a post when it's an infant. It grows up as an adult elephant where it's chained to this post that it could dislodge in a moment and rampage free, but it doesn't because it's programmed from youth to be chained to this tiny post. Mm -hmm. Your average American female is like that, a giantess programmed to be chained to a dwarf. That is a situation which needs to break, to be broken, in order for American civilization to ever mature. Well, maybe it so, needs to happen a little earlier. Maybe 16 is too late. Maybe, you know, be preschool. What can we do at a preschool level that can empower who, women and men and young young children, young boys and girls, to uh, realize that their true intrinsic value as, like, creations of this universe, of this multiverse, and powerful beings in their own right here on, in, on this planet? Uh, that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a very interesting, uh, that's an extremely valid point. And uh, I, I will have to dwell on that, but I'm sure there are other people who are trying to articulate uh, at least well, ideas. I think, it, I think it, it, it's systemic to the culture. I think because of the lack that we have in our culture on so many levels that we, we really are fighting like a, we're spinning our wheels and it, we don't seem to be getting anywhere because there's so many areas where there's so much uh, deprivation uh, uh, globally, not just well, in this country where we think we have so much plenty. But well, we're well, really, that's why we have crime. That's why we have violence. That's why we have all these things that are happening exponentially. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I understand, and uh, that's one of those things I could go to town on, but it's certainly one of those things that would, in a sense, divert us into the wrong direction. Because when we speak globally, which I love to speak in terms of, I think on strategic terms, I think in global terms. So geopolitics is actually my forte, even more so than the domestic situation in the United States. But nevertheless, what we're dealing with right now is primarily a domestic situation that is unlike the majority of other cultures in the world. The majority of other cultures in the world have their own problems. And I've mentioned how um, mm -hmm. equivalent the United States is in so many ways to Arabic Muslim culture, where the women are uh, exploited and uh, dehumanized in an entirely different sense. In the American sense, you bring up this empowerment of uh, boys and girls, and in a very real sense, uh, it's, it's valid, and other people need to address that. But the one thing I can tell you is that when it comes to the boys, I have a very different perspective because of the kind of background that I come from. Uh, the background that I come from, uh, my mother emerged from Asia, 
and uh, she, her father was Chinese, and her mother was Japanese. And these are, in uh, many respects, very different cultures, and uh, they give a very pragmatic view uh, to the world around them. So in my pragmatic view, men are inherently kind of in an empowered position uh, when they're born. Uh, men physically are stronger than women. Men uh, essentially are taller than women, mostly, generally. So as a result, men are able to enforce their will on women, and men are essentially also, in a very real sense, because they are essentially used as warriors or labor, they're generally more expendable. Uh, women, on the other hand, because they can bear life, and because that takes such an enormous amount out of them to do that, they are far less expendable. They are far more fragile as an asset of the human species. Now, a good example was Japan during World War II. Japan, during the Second World War, lost uh, a good percentage of its male population. Now, it didn't matter because, I, I mean, personally, it may have mattered terribly to some families and, and relations and lovers, etc., of course. But statistically, the biggest problem that Japan suffered after the Second World War was over in popular imagination in the United States in 1945. In reality, of course, 1952, when the Treaty of San Francisco went into effect, until that point in time, the Empire of Japan and the United States were still legally at war. Now, what was the biggest problem Japan had during that period of time? Overpopulation. <laughs> that was a problem that lasted until well into the 60s and uh, even into the 70s. Why? Because as soon as the men came home, even though there were less men, they could impregnate any number of women. So you can lose an enormous amount. You can lose 75% of your male population. And so long as you've got four times the amount of women as you do the amount of men, you can repopulate for what it's worth almost instantaneously. So men truly are the expendable gender. And that is one of those reasons why Adolf Hitler, when he was uh, approached by people who were protesting the amount of men he was expending in combat, he was literally surprised and said, that's what the young men are for. Mm. Now, Napoleon Bonaparte, when he basically was confronted about drafting boys who were 14 years of age, at that point of time when the Allies were invading France, ultimately Paris was occupied by the Russians. Think about what I'm saying. This is totally forgotten in modern American history. France, mm. Paris was occupied by the Russians. Now, at that time, he was drafting uh, boys who were barely 15 years old, probably more like 13 or 14 years old. 14, at least, was the median. And he was throwing them into combat, and his generals were asking him if this was practical. And he said, a 14-year-old boy can catch a bullet as well as a 40-year-old man. <laughs> that was, this is the whole point about the male population. They are in the evolutionary sense, in the evolutionary scheme of things, in the, in the sense of the greater picture, strategically, males are expendable. It's well, always think, Yeah, well, busy. think about what you're saying, too. I mean, well, when you went that way, I thought, that's the culture, to think that anybody is expendable, to think that anybody But this is not culture. This is, this is actually biological. This is an but how evolution. But how can we get past that kind of thinking? How can we get beyond thinking that... Well, well, it, that that's a larger question, and in a sense, that is you know, that, that's almost phil philosophical. Uh, we're in this discussion that we're talking about. We're not talking about, say, for instance, uh, the concept of whether or not war is a part of the human condition. Now, this is where I'm different from many Westerners. Westerners maintain this kind of ideal where they think that there's a evolution socially where civilizations will ultimately overcome the act of war. Now, I, with my background, look at war as just part of what makes us human. Now, Benito Mussolini actually stated, this is an actual quote, war is for men 
what childbirth is for women. Now, he was saying at an industrial state level, what you see in every tribe in New Guinea are the Amazon. The only difference is in New Guinea and the Amazon, you have tribal men going out and killing each other by the dozens as opposed to by the millions. But when they're killing each other by the dozen, proportionate to their population, it's really not much different from industrial civilizations with large populations killing each other in the millions. So this is part of the human condition. In a sense, a man's desire to kill another man is what defines us as human. If we didn't have wars, we would be the Borg. We would be a termitary. We would not be human. So it's never been my ideal to eliminate war. Rather, we're dealing with a social disease which is truly reprehensible, such as human trafficking. So when we come to human trafficking, you truly are destroying the future, as opposed to destroying up to 75% of your population of men in a conventional war where the remaining, the remaining men can come home and repopulate. You can rebound fairly easily, comparatively speaking. But in terms of human trafficking, where your females are being destroyed, you no longer have women who are even capable of mothering a sane or functional child. Then you are truly destroying your future. Well, so, and can we look at this in a, in a deeper context to where we're destroying the earth, uh, we're destroying our food, we're destroying our air, our water, we're destroying our populations. So what... What do you see is is the consensus for this insanity? I don't have other words for it. What, what, <laughs> well, you're, you're you're laying it out and you're showing that this is this is what's happening. Yes, this is how and, it's uh, happening. So what what's what's the consensus here? What what are we looking at? What, are we looking at a die off of, of of life as we know it? Well, of course not. What we are looking at in terms of, the, when you talk about this industrial pollution, the environmental pollution, this is part of an insane culture. Only an insane culture would do that. So the insane culture which dominates the world right now is the American empire. The overwhelming majority of the world's economy is catering to the American market. Now, uh, in terms of Japan, China, Everything those nations manufacture is sold in the main to the American market. When Germany manufactures so many cars, most of it is sold to the American market. There's not many roads in Europe. Even Western Europe is dominated by rail travel. So all of this is sold to the American market. The entire world's uh, environment is being plundered by an economy which caters to the remaining superpower, what's known as an ultra-power in geopolitical terms. Soviet Union is gone, and in terms of China, it's, it's certainly no longer a collectivist economy. That's part of the problem. It's industrializing, it's capitalist, it's state-controlled capitalism, and it's selling or maintaining its industries to sell to the biggest market functionally in the world, which is the United States. Now, the European market has become technically larger, but it's not plundering the world's environment the way the ultra-power, the sole American empire, the empire that dominates planet Earth, is doing. And it's doing this, Americans, without guns. They're not, right. They don't have an army which occupies the world. They don't have enough manpower. Their bases are everywhere. Their bases are all over the world. But the majority of this is done economically. So it's in a sick economy. So what's the culture that produces that economy? It's a prison rape culture. What makes mm -hmm. all of this possible is a demented culture which is based on misogyny and based on American men basically glamorizing the penitentiary culture. Now, we have the largest prison population in the world proportionate to our baseline population. China has millions of people, and as a result of having over a billion people, actually, they have millions of people in Laogai or labor camps, concentration camps, and this is where all their manufacturing, or a large part of it, is done. Now, they have less people proportionately in prison than we do. We have the third largest population on Earth, following India and China. 
We have 350 million people, 50 million of them illegal immigrants. So we've got about 300 U.S. citizens, 50 million illegals, and proportionately, an enormous amount of them are in jail. Now, of those people in prison, uh, functionally, 99% of them are male. And they're in prison, an enormous amount of them, for child predation, for rape, for domestic abuse. You've got 1% of the U.S. prison population is female. And so these men who are in jail have, in their own sense, totally subconsciously, become a lobby where their prison culture is glamorized through media. Media glamorizes Breaking Bad, uh, all kinds of other rap, gangster rap. The prison culture has become the American culture. And what do they do in prison, all these men? They rape each other. And the guards become the pimps, and they take the white-collar criminals, the men who stole money, the men who forged checks. The white-collar criminals become the bottom men for the blue-collar criminals, and the white-collar criminals are pimped out by the prison guards. The prison guards take some guy who's in there for credit card uh, exploitation, identity theft, a white-collar criminal. He takes him, he basically pimps him out to all the bank robbers, the child rapists, and those people in prison. Our entire culture has become a reflection of prison culture, and that is the culture which is raping the rest of the world. So in order to destroy this prison rape culture, this is why I keep coming back to that all-female draft for a United States police force. That would be a social revolution that would break this cycle of male-dominated abuse, which does so much to disempower females that they accept their lot and ultimately destroy the future by raising dysfunctional children that are incapable of functioning normally because their mothers have been so dysfunctionalized by this prison rape culture of sick, degenerate men. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just kind of, you know, trying to force people to do something. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if that's ever the best situation. Well, but, um, uh, we, we're not in a situation where we're given any alternatives. This is like a. This is why when people um, talk about uh, when Adolf Hitler organized the Hitler Youth as a military force and deployed them in combat. They were one of the finest combat units of the Schutzstaffel or the SS as a panzer division in the Second World War. They did enormous damage to the Allies who were invading Normandy. When Napoleon was using child soldiers, all of this becomes the norm in nations that are under siege or under invasion. Our nation, our culture, is under siege from its penitentiary system. Its penitentiary system has leaked through media into the public. And the result is a glamorization of violence, and it is the men who are committing all of that violence. Women are fatalities in an undeclared war against women. Now, as I've emphasized before, violence in the United States and worldwide, but we're concentrating on America right now, violence is not a race, it's not a class, it's not a religion, it's not a nationality but it is a gender. Ours is a culture productive of a rape every single minute. Mm -hmm. Every single minute there is a rape in the United States. In the United States alone, every passing day, there are a thousand living, breathing, bleeding female bodies sundered into cadavers. Well, that's each and every year that are officially recognized. A thousand, at least, every year that are recognized as victims of just pure, gratuitous assault that wind up dead. So men suffer violence, uh, largely at the hands of other men, but here in the United States, we get the reported rape every 72 seconds. That's every, you know, a little over a minute. Now, that's officially acknowledged. So since only one in five rapes are reported, that means the reality is obviously far higher. 
we're acknowledging right. at least a rape a minute, but the reality is far higher. And specifically, uh, the Constitutional Republic uh, abides an annual reportage of about 87,000 uh, rapes a year. So that means that um, why doesn't anyone declare this for what it is? Not a series of isolated incidents. This is literally a war. This is a gender war where one gender is destroying another. So when you factor in the unreported assaults, I mean, it gets, it gets insane. Literally, female battering, wife battering, girlfriend battering, uh, pimps battering uh, their chattel. That's the number one cause of injury to an American woman. A woman is beaten every nine seconds. Every nine seconds in the United States. Not every nine minutes, but every nine seconds. This amounts to 9,000 and 600 batterings a day, 900 and 6,000 batterings, 9,000 and 600 batterings a day. Right. And that means of the 2 million American women so injured annually, over half a million of them require medical attention. So all of those statistics, by the way, were from the Center for Disease Control. So we're talking about the disease of domestic battering. Now, about 145,000 of those casualties require overnight admissions or hospitalizations. And you don't even want to know about the dentistry that's required afterwards. Now, spouses, think about what I'm going to say here. Spouses are the leading cause of death for pregnant women in the United States. Wow. Not miscarriage. Not uh, some kind of cesarean section resulting in a, um, a collateral damage that ultimately kills them through internal bleeding. It's their spouses. American spouses beat their pregnant wives to death more than in any other nation. You are in a culture of monsters. The average American male is not a human being. He is a monster. This is why you need a draft for an all female police force. Okay, so who's going to write the petition and uh, get the signatures and send them out to the Congress and get this on the, on the ballot well, or get this into legislation? And... Well, it's basically, I'm just a conceptualist. The least that can start is a dialogue. Of course, if we circulate the idea for a petition, I'm certain that other people will begin to respond. Now, I myself, like I said, I'm just a borderline homeless veteran. I may have nothing else to do in one sense, but I've got plenty to do in terms of trying to keep myself alive <laughs> in terms of other senses, so I'm not exactly well, the person who's going to be. Well, if, you're, if you feel that you're going to be homeless, well, I want you to know that uh, Carolyn and I have a facility. <laughs> oh, you're wonderful. Thank you. And you, you can I, split I, between I, uh, two of us. We'll, we'll share thank reluctantly. Thank but you uh, always have a yes, place yes. here in our hearts, Thank if you. not in our homes. Yeah, that, 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 that's very much appreciated. That's very, believe me, it's very much appreciated. You have no idea. Uh, when, I, when I told my stepdad, who, who was a veteran 20 years in the Navy, that a third of the homeless were veterans, he got yeah. furious. He was furious. He, he, he should and, be. And I w but he was mad that I would say something like that. He 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 thought who who was I to even say something? Oh, like that? I see what you're saying. Oh and, my God, what a dull! What a dull! Well, <laughs> no, and I and I and getting all this information, I I didn't vet it as well as I should have. So I wasn't on as good footing to be able to to give him more information about why that was true. But I knew it was true. I knew it with my heart. Today, he died in 2010. Today, my mother knows. She's in contact with veteran women from from the Korean War who are working together with other veteran women to help the veterans in, in Sarasota because there's so many homeless there, veterans. There's so many people who don't have services, veterans. They're, they don't have medical treatment. They don't have basic needs that should be a given for a veteran of the United States, the greatest superpower. So we we understand this. I mean, today we understand this. When I first said that to him, maybe it was before 2009, maybe 2007. Well, I got awesome. into this around yeah. 2003. So I, I, I tortured everybody. 
<laughs> these statistics oh, by, by the way, just to, <laughs> so I don't sound too judgmental against him. Uh, he might have taken it from the perspective that, see, all these uh, veterans are unemployable and they're, they're, they have no motivation, they're lazy and they don't work, and that's why they're homeless. A lot of people were really he, defensive. He thought I was lying. I think he thought I made it up. Oh, it couldn't be possible, not in this country. It couldn't be possible. That's so they, sad. That is so they, sad. They don't, they ha I have a sister whose husband, she was in the Navy too, and she got out because of an injury, and her husband uh, retired, a master uh, gunny sergeant in the Marines. Mm -hmm. you, you couldn't tell them anything derogatory about this country, about this government. Oh, you couldn't like tell God. them anything. Because th this is the superpower. This is America. What do you think they fought for? So you could have the freedom to even say what, whatever you want to say, whether well, it's true I, or not. That, that, you know? that, that, is, that is really such a, um, how would we say it, that is such a crock. Because when we say that we have the freedom to say something, the reality is that the greatest uh, censor in the United States is the American public themselves. Absolutely. The sheep and, are, are, uh, are guarding the sheep. <laughs> yes. Just as yeah, David Icke so. said. Well, the sheep are guarding the sheep dogs. You see, <laughs> the wolves are running the country. The sheep dogs who are trying to care for the sheep and protect them from the wolves, such as whistleblowers, such as people like yourself. Oh, I know. It's, a, it's ironic. Go ahead. Say it. Say it. Yes. And uh, so, as I say, the sheep dogs, such as yourself and Carolyn Goida, who are trying to alert the sheep, are persecuted by the sheep when you're trying to alert them against the wolves. And who not are only running. that, they're, they're fighting amongst each yeah. other. They're fighting yeah. amongst each other. Can you imagine? As much as we know and understand, we're, we're condemning and pointing fingers at each other. Right. It's un well, that's unbelievable. Yeah, well, it's it's definitely, that's exactly what the wolves want. That's exactly what they take advantage of. But don't give them the credit that they're coordinating it to too great an extent. No. The wolves themselves, I actually do wolves an injustice and an insult by comparing the American predators of the overworld, of the establishment, of the elite, to wolves. They're more like just um, really uh, morbidly inbred uh, there's no animal I would want them to, to compare to them compare to. Compare really. them to, yes, I got Yeah, they're just they're just morbidly they're, inbred. They're stupid as hell. They're, <laughs> they're and and that's where the alien concepts come in. They're not of this earth. They're not. They're, they well, can't be. Well, that would be that would be almost giving them too much credit because Carolyn said, the, "Amen." <laughs> yeah, they they really are incredibly stupid. If they really had their act, if they were really brilliant, they would give everybody enough money to live on and stay happy with so that everybody would have something to lose. But they took everything. They take well, everything. They, they take everything makes, that's not... And, it makes and, the and, archonic, uh, the yeah. archonic uh, premise so viable that that's what they really want. They want the fear. They want the anger. They want the rage. They want us to be living uh, subsistence lives so that we're <laughs> always uh, wanting... We're, uh, we're always look, lacking and, and never able to overcome. Well, if they're if they're feeding off of that, then uh, of course the um, they're really playing with fire. Because when you give people absolutely nothing to lose, the end result, of course, is always going to be at some point uh, a toppling of the system. It just crashes in and on itself. And then what are they going to feed on? The juice of the anarchy that follows. Uh, ultimately, born out of that will be some kind of scapegoating of some kind of targeted elite group. So in the end, uh, they truly lose out. Uh, that is what we can look forward to, is a reconstruction. And a reconstruction of the world around us is something that will um, inevitably lead to a more positive world. It can't get any worse. I assure you, we're at the bottom. There's no place to go but up. But in terms of trying to ease the fall, that's why I come up uh, with a solution such as I have with that idea of a national draft of females, a United States police force, that would help soften the fall because then you would have generation, at least a generation, probably two or three if we're very lucky, of females who have been so empowered and as a result are better able to raise children as we reconstruct the world around us that are functional and uh, these women would have a sense of uh, independence, of self-assertion, and of self-respect, and of genuine educational and technical training that would put them light years ahead of
just being some victimized broodmare. Um, and, and to put that broodmare uh, equation into perspective for anyone who has doubted anything that I have said, uh, so many men murder. They don't even call them girlfriends and they don't even call them wives anymore because no straight or heterosexual couple ever gets married anymore statistically. So what they call them in law enforcement is intimate partners and formerly intimate partners, ips and fips. And so many men murder their ips and fips that we have well over 1,000 homicides in that category alone every year. So that means every three years, the female intimate death toll tops 9-11's officially acknowledged fatalities. Yet nobody declares a domestic war on terror. So the whole mountain chain of over 12,000 gynecological cadavers from domestic violence homicides that get churned out through America's most productive cottage industry, which is this cottage industry of gynocide, since 9-11, think about what Can I'm saying. Can you say that again? Gynocide? Say that again. Gynocide. Gynocide. The genocide of the female. <sighs> Since 9-11, the number of women who have been murdered in that category of girlfriends and ex-girlfriends exceeds the number of both the officially total deaths of victims on 9-11 itself in combination with the number of deaths of all American soldiers killed in the war on terror ever since. So that means that it's statistically far more dangerous to be an American woman than it is to be an American soldier. Mm. That really ought to put it into perspective. This is a war, a civil war in the United States. An army needs to be raised to respond to it. That is why we need a draft. This isn't a choice. (laughs) This is is a trying to formulate a question about what it, now we know marriage is on the decline what what does this do to the to the family i mean w- w- as we look at this and we, as we move forward how do how do you see this the is family? why it's so important this is why it's so important to draft women into an artificial family if they have a family which they identify with in this united states police force they start an old girls network then they begin to interrelate and network with other women so they can start babysitting for each other, cooperating with each other on a much more organized level. This is the only thing that can help save the society. Because right now, what these women do is they have these children and they just glom onto whatever wife beaten creep they can glom onto for a home who hopefully has a job and can hopefully bring some food that will feed both their children and themselves. This is the kind of cycle of violence that the male monsters who dominate the society want. They want these women barefoot, pregnant, helpless, floating from man to man. That way they can grab a new girl up uh, every other day, some homeless chick who's hitchhiking, basically the functional equivalent thereof. My idea would help eliminate that. You get the women who are circulating and networking amongst themselves. This would be a sea change in Western civilization and America would exemplify its own rehabilitation in the eyes of the world. Yeah, and, and empower the women at the same time. It's a, it's 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 workable. <laughs> and once I get over that, you have to do this thing. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> no, but, but uh, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. Yes. The, well, young lady, um, it's about uh, a few minutes to 9 p.m. here in California. I'm sure it's well after midnight where you're at, or am I wrong? No, it's just about 10 of midnight but you you've given us almost three hours of your wonderful time and conversation oh, and uh, and all i can say is thank you douglas and hopefully we can get you back and talk about some other topics that were brought up tonight oh i would love to and um believe me my uh, love to both uh, yourself carolyn rose goida anyone who's listening out there uh shout out to laura lee solomon Pamela Duff, whoever else might be listening. Uh, But definitely, uh, I want you to know that it has been an absolute honor to be here. And I do beg you on bended knee to send the audio archives once a link is up. I I do presume that some archives will be linked somewhere. Uh, If you you could send me a link to that through both my managers or myself in email, uh, please do so as soon as you get it available. Within the next 12 hours, it should be completed, no problem. And you are free, of course, to post it on my timeline, my Facebook timeline. Well, thank you. 
thank yeah. you so much. And thank, well, thank you, you, Douglas, for your uh, amazing uh, layout of, of the conversation. Uh, you gave us a total baseline of how this is happening, what's happening, why it's happening, and what we can do to counter, in some respects, uh, the disempowerment of women in the United yeah. States. So thank you so much for... Uh, and uh, wait a minute, don't go anywhere because I think Carolyn sent me a message. Great job. E-hug okay. to you and uh, and she loves us. And uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. We love you too. And Well, thank you, Douglas. I'm going to go because you deserve rest. Thank you. Well, that's to both you lovely young ladies. Okay. And we'll see you Tuesday <laughs> on your show. And you want to give us your website so that everybody knows where to find you. Thank you so much. My website is www.douglasdietrich.com. Douglas is spelled with one S, and Dietrich is spelled just like the famous actress's last name, Marlena Dietrich. For those of you who are too young to remember that, which is an ever-increasing amount of our listenership, uh, just put the words diet and rich together, D-I-E-T-R-I-C-H, so douglasdietrich.com. And... Uh, Look that up and uh, do uh, feel free to hit me up on my Facebook timeline, uh, Douglas, uh, Facebook.com slash Douglas Dwayne Dietrich is the public timeline, which is easier to assess. Feel free to put a like on that. Help me hit the 3,000 mark. And, uh, of course, uh, now that's the one thing that I have that I'm really envious of women about. Now, that's where there's an unfair advantage. There's all these really attractive young ladies put up these public timelines, and they get, like, a million hits within months. Uh, someone like me, I, of course, have to earn every like I get. I'm fortunate that I've got close to 3,000, so I'm trying to reach that mark for now. Yeah, and, but just uh, think that all those people that are, that are liking your work are actual admirers of you and not just your your beautiful physique <laughs> that's an excellent point thank you i do appreciate that and, uh, uh at, at any rate uh, once again i also have a revolution uh radio program of my own and uh i am uh, very proud that i was able to kind of cross uh uh radio boundaries and uh and speak with um, oh, your your radio stations, Awake and Aware, or something like that. No, it's just Awake Radio, and we're also on Shiziz. We're we're simulcasting on two stations. But go ahead. Excellent. And uh, people who want to can check me out. Uh, my hours do not, in any way, shape, or form, conflict with those of Chrissy McMahon. And I'm on Saturdays and Tuesdays from uh, ten to midnight Eastern Standard Time. And uh, so definitely you can check out Saturdays. I do two hours of uh, just taking questions and uh, communicating with the public uh, called Saturday Night Firing Lines. And Tuesdays are topical. Tuesdays are critical omissions is the name of the program where I just talk about a historical or current events topic. So uh, definitely thank you for giving me an opportunity to plug myself, dear lady. And uh, I will certainly be happy to plug you in the near future and we shall do so as soon as you call in to saturday night firing lines hopefully next saturday uh, absolutely and i and i have a proposal i was i was thinking as uh, we were talking but i'll take us off air and we can talk about that and thank you douglas soon you see what's sending out the negative waves did moriarty but oddball i did try and tell them but they won't listen i tried sure but I did. I did try. Oh, man. Don't hit me with them negative waves so early in the morning. But I can't force them. Listen, I can't. Always with the negative waves, Moriarty. Always.